I just want to take a minute uh, to thank everyone for being here today um, and let everyone know this is what um, Senator Staines and I envision as the first of a lengthy series of hearings, a, a, a very um, in-depth conversation about all the aspects that a policy change of this magnitude um, means for our state. I know there are folks here um, on both sides of the issue wishing to provide testimony, but today, uh, the, the plan for today is to hear from the two witnesses um, who have the most hands-on direct experience um, in states where this is already the law. Um, and uh, the, the, this is a neutral view. This is an objective review of what's been happening in other states. We anticipate as we move forward um, with, with uh, hearings over the, the coming weeks and months, we will have an opportunity to hear from everyone. Um, any, of, any of you who are here today wishing to submit testimony, if you want to submit written testimony to either Senator Staines or myself, we'd be more than happy to make sure that that gets to every member of the committee, even those who aren't here yet. Um, and with that, I want to make sure that we respect everyone's time and and get things underway. There'll be plenty of time for questions from members. Um, and I want to hand it over to Senator Staines. So, yeah, so Senate Bill 316 and House Bill 2353 um, does set up a framework. Um, it's a, uh, a framework to tax and regulate uh, marijuana for recreational purposes here. Um, it is as, uh, a major policy shift. We understand that. So we really do in, intend to not call this bill for votes this session. We are planning on doing, as Kelly said, a number of hearings um, over uh, some period of time and really seek lots of input in how um, this might be structured to work um, well in Illinois. Um, you know, two years ago, I was not somebody who felt like this was necessarily the right thing to be doing um, in Illinois. Uh, as I have um, been looking and understanding and learning from the medical marijuana experience here, and then when we had done the decrim bill last year, I have become convinced that trying to look at doing a tax and regulate structure really makes a lot of sense. Um, prohibition right now, I think, just does not work. Um, and we know we have around 750,000 people in Illinois who we think are using cannabis, um, and just 17,000 people who have those cards. Um, so most of them are going to the black market. So we wanted to take a look and understand what is happening around the country um, on taxing and regulating, and are there other ways to be thinking about this. Um, today we're going to hear first from Barbara Broll, who's the Executive Director of the Department of Revenue in, Sh in Colorado, and she's been responsible for implementing um, the programs related to cannabis in Colorado. And then the second um, witness we'll hear from is from the National Conference of State Legislators, who is just going to give us an overview about what's happening in the country regarding cannabis laws. Um, and then we'll be setting up a number of hearings to talk about all the issues that you get along with this, what happens with public safety, how does it affect law enforcement, what are the economic development potential impacts. We'll be doing a whole series. Right now we have um, six... 695 uh, proponents who have filed witness slips, 27 oppositions, and one no position on the merits. Um, we will be looking forward to having lots of opportunities for much conversation. Um, right now, we ask Barbara Bold, uh, Broll, excuse me, to please come on up to the table. She is going to be our first um, witness today, and uh, we'll let you, there, there's a green button, there's a push button there, you're going to want to push, uh, that'll bring you up, and um, when it gets green, we know you're on. Um, and I think she's got a presentation we're walking through, and if you don't have a copy yet, we're getting more copies made, and we'll get, get it to you. Uh, welcome. It's so great to have you. Please, first thing off, just state your name for the record, and then I know you have a presentation to walk through. We look forward to that, and then we'll open it up for Q&A after that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Barbara Broll, and I'm the Executive Director for the Department of Revenue. Uh, first, I want to thank the committee for inviting me to come here and provide some information as to the legalization efforts and regulation efforts is really what it is in Colorado. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I have um, been regulating marijuana in the state of Colorado since 2011 when I was appointed to my position. The very first thing I want to tell this committee and your public is that I am neither an opponent nor a proponent for the regulation and legalization of marijuana. My job is to regulate and my job is to implement. Um, in the year 2000, um, voters voted to um, not decriminalize but to essentially legalize uh, medical marijuana uh, for 
uh, for use uh, in certain instances. And then in 2012, they also voted again with Amendment 64 to legalize it for non-medical purposes. So for those of you who have the um, presentation, the agenda will be, and I'm going to go through this very quickly because I want to be respectful of your time and really leave it open for you to ask me questions on the areas where you are more uh, interested. So I'm going to give you an overview, which is really the background of, uh, and backdrop of what we're doing, the structure of the division and the regulatory process, the results, and then challenges. So um, as you can see, the Department of Revenue does a number of things. I'm responsible for DMV taxation, uh, the uh, state lottery, and then enforcement of the industries of gaming, uh, liquor and tobacco, automotive dealers, horse racing, and medical and recreational marijuana. And if you'll go to slide six, uh, you'll see that there's a framework, and there are three boxes there, the red, yellow, and green. And red is where uh, marijuana usage was coming from prior to any of these two legalization efforts. That's essentially the criminal effort, and that was the black market. As we have moved over to the right, um, we have become more of a regulated model. There are certain things in the yellow that allow for private um, growth and private consumption and private use. And so those are yellow, and those are through Amendment uh, 20 and Amendment 64 as well. But in the green area, that's the commercial licensed regulated segment, and that's kind of the space where I live. Um, and if you'll go to the next uh, slide, slide 7, uh, you'll see there are two industry segments. Those segments are the medical market and the recreational market, and they're all license-based. They all require that they are state-licensed and on the medical side, they're also locally licensed, and on the recreational side, the local jurisdiction has other um, capabilities as well. Uh, and there are cultivations, there are products manufacturers, stores, labs, and there are two new ones this last year, and they are operator licenses, so if you have a, a kind of a management company to come in and operate, or transporter licenses as well. If we go to slide eight, um, it'll tell you how we got here. So Amendment 20, as I mentioned, was uh, voted on in the year 2000. It, it provided for a caregiver model. It generally allowed for six plants per patient to be grown, about two ounces each, and a patient would, would have to obtain a physician recommendation. Um, during that first few years, there was a lot of um, more commercialization of that for two reasons. Number one, there was a Department of Justice coal memorandum that came out that basically said that they would prioritize low the enforcement of medical marijuana usage and cultivation in states that had a regulatory program. And then there were some uh, uh, issues that went up to our state Supreme Court. As a result, we started to see a lot of the green crosses all over. And in 2010, our legislature acted and I'm said, sorry, can you pull your mic a little bit closer? Some of the members are having trouble yes, hearing you. Yes, I, I will. My apologies. And in 2010, then our legislature acted and determined that what they needed to do was actually put some rigor around this. And what we started then was the, um, that process at that point. On slide 9, it talks about Amendment 64, tells you what it does, what it does not do. It allows for personal growth up to six plants per adult and uh, and use. Uh, and it also allows for anyone over the age of 21 to be able to purchase and then consume. Cannot consume openly or in public. That's part of the amendment. Uh, and then it allows for the system of licensed marijuana establishments, as I mentioned. Uh, one of the really key things is that uh, both of these, both the statute and then now the this amendment and, this, and the resulting statutes require a very rigorous background check. You have to go through a criminal, owners must go through a criminal fingerprint-based FBI background check, and there's also a, an extensive financial background check. Very similar to those of you who uh, regulate gaming or, or know about the gaming industry, we use some of those best practices. Um, and then if you'll um, take a look at slide 10, uh, the way that we started was uh, when the governor proclaimed the election to be valid, he also, by executive order, issued a requirement for a task force. And I was one of the two individuals who led that task force. And what we did is we brought in a number of individuals that had very diverse uh, uh, viewpoints in order to make sure that we looked at this from all aspects. We were required to provide a report to the governor, the attorney general's office, and the um, uh, legislature as well. Uh, the 
task force, which is what I think you're talking about doing, is um, uh, was uh, we did we had that that was conducted for about two and a half months, and we had a task force, and we also had uh, individual groups that were uh, uh, subcommittees, so to speak, and they were. Uh, regulatory in nature, they were law enforcement in nature, they were public safety in nature, they were not in public health. And then you can see on page 11 what the uh, time frames were. And these were uh, very aggressive time frames that were placed in the amendment. So we were required to have um, rules in place by July 1st of 2013. We had to begin accepting applications on October 1st of 2013 and begin to license 1114. And if you look at uh, slide 12, that'll give you a list of all the stakeholders that were a part of that particular uh, task force. And you can see there were a number of very v diverse stakeholders because our view was if you get people that are on opposite sides of the situation, you can almost always come up with a better solution because you've really addressed things. If you look at slide 14, we had some very specific regulatory objectives in all of this, and the first one was public safety. Uh, the second one was preventing distribution of marijuana to minors, then preventing the involvement of criminal enterprises, gangs, cartels, in the legal marijuana industry, and then preventing diversion uh, to regulated mar uh, of regulated marijuana to other states and criminal markets. And then all of this was under the auspices of a very transparent regulatory oversight. Uh, everything that we've done is on our website. Every report, every um, everything is there. And so all of our rules, so you can go and take a look at it. Page uh, 16, or 15 rather, will show you that it was a very highly collaborative rulemaking process and we've continued with that kind of collaboration throughout uh, the last three years. It's uh, the use of those stakeholder work groups as we've talked about before. Uh, and when everybody comes to the table, there two things really come out of that. And one is that everybody feels like they've been heard, and they are heard. And uh, I have to, I'm the state licensing authority, and I, I carefully consider everything that comes before me. I read every piece of paper, I read every comment before I put my name on anything. But one of the things we found through these stakeholdering rulemaking processes was that we came out with what we call negotiated rulemaking. And so everybody walked out a little bit um, okay, a little bit pleased, and a little bit displeased, and so that kind of means that we were probably hitting the the middle point in the sweet spot. But the bigger thing that we started to realize was that the industry became much more voluntarily compliant because they had been involved in this, and they knew we were listening to them as a regulated industry, like any other industry that we regulate, and so they were able to implement the rules and requirements that they were actually uh, addressing. So if you'll go to 16, you'll see some of the uh, regulations that we put in place to protect minors, uh, child-resistant packaging, and if it's a, um, a, a multiple-serving uh, uh, product, it has to retain its child resistancy. Uh, it also has to be opaque so that you can't see what's inside of it. Extensive labeling. There are advertising restrictions that we have uh, so that you can't target um, uh, youth. Uh, waste removal, production limits. Uh, we, we have to manage production. And then enforcement and underage compliance checks. Similar to the way that we go into liquor stores and bars and restaurants to determine whether or not there is uh, going to be some underage purchasing that's going to be allowed um, inadvertently or, in, or intentionally, we do the very same thing with this. Uh, then on uh, slide 17, you can see some of those regulations that were protecting public safety. That is a really big issue for me, and that is a really big responsibility. The amendment itself requires me to balance public safety with burden on the industry, and public safety is paramount. Uh, so as I mentioned, there are production management, restrictions on purchase amounts, restrictions on hours of operation, restrictions on where one can consume. You cannot consume on the premises. Uh, restrictions on edibles, and then video surveillance. Everywhere marijuana can be touched in the licensed premises must have a video camera on it, including ingress and egress and at the point of sale. If you look at uh, slide 18, you can see how uh, what our guiding principles are for with regard to um, development of rulemaking. So transparent, systematic, operable, and defensible. Now we'll go into the structure. And if you look on page uh, or slide 20, um, these are the reports that we have uh, had either completed ourselves or had completed for us. Uh, the Amendment 64 Task Force Final Report. 
we actually conducted a demand study, so we know what the demand for marijuana is in the state of Colorado, and that's really important when you're looking to see if you're making a some headway into the black market or if you're managing production. Uh, we also had an edible work group report because we really needed to come up with additional rules around edible products, which I will talk to you about. And then marijuana equivalency. Um, and then our annual report, which gives you all the, you know, everything. How much marijuana is in the state, how much is consumed. Um, the edibles work group was really important. Uh, we came up with several new uh, requirements. One was that all edibles have to, on the recreational side, each serving can only be 10 milligrams of THC or less. Every product that has more than one serving in it must be specifically scored so that it's intuitive, that it's multiple servings. And then we have a um, universal symbol that also must be stamped or imprinted on every one of those so you know and your children know and your, everybody knows if there is uh, an edible product that's being consumed or could be consumed. And then with the reason we needed to do the equivalency study was because the amendment said that one ounce or its equivalent was um, lawful. So if you go on to page 21, you'll see how we structure the Marijuana Enforcement Division, which is a division that's within my department. So the first part is business and individual licensing, and that's kind of a gatekeeping function. So as I mentioned, the background checks and the licensing, and all individuals are licensed that work in this industry. Uh, even the uh, what they call bud tenders, the individual or horticulturists, or anyone that works in there still has to be licensed. So that's different than uh, regulate like alcohol, but it's a lot sim more similar to regulate like gaming. So we use a lot of those best practices, as I mentioned. And then there is um, field enforcement. So I have uh, over half of the staff that I have within the Marijuana Enforcement Division are post-certified peace officers. And so they know how to do criminal investigation as well as compliance investigation. And so they go out and they do all sorts of um, compliance checks. Page 22 will show you how many businesses there are in the state. The state by itself, the state government does not limit the number. What we do is limit production so that we know that um, there's sufficient amount, but we, uh, but we don't limit the numbers. The amendment allows for the local jurisdictions, because Colorado is a very local jurisdiction strong state. And so the local jurisdictions can actually limit time, place, manner, and number, or they can do outright bans. So there's a lot of local control in the amendment and in the, um, uh, uh, and the other uh, statutes that surrounded that. As you can see, there are approximately 3,000 business licenses approved across the state. 1561 uh, are medical licenses, and 1410 are retail licenses, and that's everything from cultivations down to labs. And if you look on your slide 23, you'll see what those licenses look like for both the owners as well as the occupational individuals who just work there. Slide 24 will give you some of the primary activities that my field enforcement staff does. We do compliance investigations. We, com we uh, address uh, complaints that come in. Uh, we also have, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, a seed to sale tracking system. And so every, every plant is tracked through with an RFID tag from the time that it's an eight uh, inch plant, so once it's viable, up until the time that it's sold. Uh, and so we're able to gather a lot of data and so we can evaluate risk factors and then uh, perform additional compliance checks. Uh, page, uh, slide 25 is, uh, addresses uh, the testing requirements. So uh, we uh, test for potency, we test for homogeneity, and for homogeneity what that means is if you have an edible product that is about this any size and it has more than one serving in it, you want to make sure that the THC is equally uh, distributed throughout so that the person who takes a bite of it doesn't get all of it, so that's homogeneity. We test for residual solvents because there are many ways to extract THC from marijuana, and one of them is to use um, butane, and not only is that dangerous, but it also can leave so some of the residual solvent in there, so we test for that. Uh, there are microbials. Uh, and uh, that we test for and mold. Uh, one thing I want to say, and then we also are starting this whole process with the medical side. The one thing I want to talk about residual solvents, though, is that butane is not lawful for um, a lot of facilities. It's really only lawful in some facilities because of the fact that it can have some danger associated with it. So if we move then to 
uh, slide 26, you'll see what the RFID tag looks like. This is a really key component of this, and the reason for that is because it tracks that plant, as I mentioned, from seed to sale. And some of the other states will talk about it as a trace and track kind of system. And there are three pieces of information uh, that you'll see. One is a seven-digit code, so if this is a very small business, they can do it through those seven-digit codes. There are, there are on the bottom, there's a bar code, so similar to the grocery store, so if you, you know, if they have a barcode reader, they can, their little larger shop, they can use that. Uh, and then embedded inside it is the RFID technology, and that they can use a handheld uh, device in order to determine, and that's what we use when we go out there and do a compliance check. On slide 27, you'll see what it looks like on the plant, and it stays there through cultivation and uh, until it's processed, it's harvested, dried, and then put in in other uh, containers and packages. And then slide 28 will show you what it looks like when it turns itself into a label to go onto the package. So it continues its, 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 um, its tracking throughout. Slide 29 will show you what the um, universal symbol is. We uh, have a universal symbol that it has to be on every label as well as every product. And you'll see they're different from medical to recreational as well. Uh, now, uh, here are some pictures. So if you'll take a look at uh, slides 30 and 31, you'll see some of the extraction methods because these are ways that you have to pull that, th that the products manufacturers will pull the THC out of the marijuana plant. And it was just so you can kind of see there are small versions and there are larger versions. One uses cold water and ice to extract, and the other one uses CO2. Slide 32 will show you what the symbol, the universal symbol, looks like on the package. And slide 33 will show you what it looks like on the product. And they must have that on there. This was a really key thing because, as I mentioned, I really listen carefully to what um, the public tells us. And, and I will tell you that all of our stakeholdering work groups uh, we have members of uh, diverse groups that come in and are part of our committee, but also we also set aside time for public comment and public testimony as well at every one of these. And so one of these, uh, it was a school resource officer that came in and talked to us, and one of the things he said was, you know, it may increase the coolness factor for a product and a candy uh, for youth. They may decide that's why they want to have it because it makes them feel uh, like they're cool. And what he said is that um, so it might actually introduce more usage. However, he didn't really think so and I agreed with him. What he did say to me though was that when these kids are walking down the hall at school and if they have it, he can do his job because he can see it and he can pull them into a room and he can have the conversation with them and their parents will know. So results, if we go into page 36, 35, um, uh, one of the biggest key factors here is taxation. And the one thing I want to tell you is this is, taxation is a key component of this because regulation and good regulation costs money. It takes longer than you think, it costs more than you think, and it's harder than you think. But this sort of thing, people were consuming marijuana in Colorado and in other states, I'm absolutely convinced, long before it became uh, legal. So these, there were social costs that surrounded this. What marijuana does, taxation money does, is it allows for my staff to be fully funded, both my marijuana enforcement division staff and my tax staff. It also allows for um, programs for youth prevention and programs for substance abuse prevention and treatment. And those are the kinds of things that it actually goes for. In addition, as you'll see on this slide, we have a, um, we have a three tier taxation for recreational. And the first tier is a 15% excise tax on the first transfers of unprocessed marijuana when it leaves the cultivation, regardless of where it goes. And um, the first $40 million of that goes to school construction and the rest of that stays in the public school system as well, and it goes to um, fund the public school fund. So all of that 15% goes to that. There is a 10% special sales tax uh, that's on the point of sale of recreational marijuana, and the first 85% of that 10% is retained by the state, and that's what um, goes to 
fund um, the uh, programs that I talked about. The other 15 cent is dispersed and distributed back to the local jurisdictions on a pro rata basis based on their sales. And then there's a regular 2.9% state sales tax that um, also is assessed on both medical and recreational. If you take a look at uh, slide 40, 40 I think, no, 38. Oh, it's might say 40, I don't know why it says that. Uh, it'll show you how those tax di distributions are done. Um, and here is one of the reasons that we have to have RFID technology. You'll see on your slide 37. Uh, you can see the number of plants that are uh, tracked in our metric system. That is our seed to sale tracking system. Many of these cultivations can be very, very dense. You know, it's, it's expensive to uh, lease or purchase warehouse space, and so they're very, very dense. And to actually go in between those plants to count them would take a long time and probably have some error rate. What we can do with our handheld devices is actually go into a room this size, and even if it's dense, they're densely um, uh, grown, we can still track every single one of them. Um, slide 38 will just give you some information on the regulated marijuana market in Colorado. This is from our annual report. Uh, I think it's important to know what's being done and the differences between medical and recreational. One of the things that we expected to see and did not see was a flood of individuals from the medical side um, purchasers, patients over into the recreational side because no longer do they have to uh, then go in and, and go see a doctor and, and actually have their name on some list. But we didn't see a lot of that. Um, we didn't see a lot of really increase in, in uh, usage, quite honestly. And a lot of our um, reports and all the studies that we've done, we have a Healthy Kids Colorado survey, we're not seeing an increase or a change in uh, youth use or even really adult use. Um, there are some differences up and down throughout the years, but it's not statistically significant. And so what we're finding is those that were consuming before still are, and those that weren't still aren't. And so that's been, and, and I, we we're hoping that a lot of our education and, and uh, to the public and to youth have been a uh, part of that. If you look at slide 39, you'll see um, what our local jurisdictions have done. And you can kind of see that there are jurisdictions that have banned both medical and recreational. There are jurisdictions that have allowed both, and there are some that allow only one or the other. And they've stayed pretty consistent uh, from uh, last year to this year. Um, slide 40 will show you um, the violations and penalties. As a state licensing authority, I determine who gets licensed. I, get, I determine who gets sanctioned. And so uh, I have, as I mentioned, uh, a large number of criminal investigators, and they, they, they investigate uh, issues, and they bring those to me, and then we determine what those sanctions will be. I have three primary um, uh, penalties that I can assess, and I'll talk about the one on the bottom first that's the least impactful, and that is the license infractions. Those are going to be things like they changed a room and didn't let us know in advance, or things like they didn't input everything into metric um, every day, but they did it every other day. And those uh, can be a suspension uh, up to a $10,000 fine per violation. Then the ones in the middle are license violations, and those are a little bit more uh, serious, and those uh, can also be suspension or revocation, and those can be a fine up to 50000 And then uh, public safety violations, those are ones that I can summarily suspend a license immediately, and uh, then we can uh, I can fine up to $100,000, and I can either revoke or suspend the license. Um, what is it going to take to actually do this sort of thing? At least for Colorado, on slide 41, it'll show you. In my Marijuana Enforcement Division, I have 108 appropriated FTE. It costs about $12.25 million a year to run that group. And as I mentioned, more, more than half are, are, are post-certified law enforcement. On the next slide, you'll see what it is on slide 42 uh, for, uh, to set up the tax division, because the tax division is within my organization as well. And uh, so we have about 19 FTE there, and it costs about $1.36 million. Uh, the reason that this is really important is because this is an industry that didn't, 
was not as comfortable, uh, and I don't mean it that way, but they weren't used to paying taxes on a lot of what they were doing, and so we're bringing them into the fold, and uh, they're paying their taxes now. We need to make sure of that. So um, if you'll take a look at 44, I'll show you how we do that, and that is um, I'm sure that your tax groups probably audit about 10 to 15 percent of the businesses in an industry every year. Well, what we do with this marijuana industry is we tax audit them 100 percent of the businesses every three years. So they're on a rolling cycle. And we have criminal tax uh, special agents that investigate uh, cases of uh, tax evasion as well. They work very closely with the Marijuana Enforcement Division, and they utilize the metric system so they can know whether product is being transferred and it isn't getting excise taxed or sales taxed. Um, I think it's always important to talk about our challenges. As I mentioned, I'm kind of I'm very objective. I'm, I'm not biased one way or the other. Uh, on slide 46, you'll see what some of our initial challenges were. They were an aggressive implementation deadline. We had from November of 2012 to January of 2014, we literally had 11 months, I mean 13 months to implement this. There was a lack of established infrastructure, uh, and there was, there was no model to follow. We were the first in the world to do this on a recreational basis, and so we really had to figure out how to do this. Uh, so there was no established infrastructure. Uh, we didn't have a, a good sustainable funding model, and so we had to figure that out. And I will tell you that if you don't fund this appropriately and have a sustainable funding model, it probably won't work. Um, we had a lot of difficulties at first. Uh, working on uh, with our local jurisdictions, we had to work those issues out. Uh, we also were allowed uh, at the 2010 to allow, they were a lot of the un licensed businesses were allowed to operate while we got them licensed and that was very difficult. Um, so if you'll go into onto slide 47, they'll tell you what the ongoing challenges are. Uh, again, implementation timelines. We have bills every single legislative cycle. There is no way to have everything done at the very, you know, know everything from soup to nuts at the very beginning. You are going to have changes. And the best advice that I can give you on that is to create a structure by which you can be flexible and nimble in making the changes that you need and identifying them and, and being able to do that. And, and in Colorado, that's our stakeholder uh, working group process. Um, rapid organizational growth. Production management, we're always on top of that. Edibles, as I mentioned, we had some issues with edibles. We had to jump on top of those really fast. Pesticides, the banking, um, are all part of this lack of uh, federal regulatory assistance. But I want to talk about gray market first. And gray market is what we call when you can cultivate legally, but, you dis but it's distributed illegally. And in Colorado, we've had some concerns about that. And what we're doing this year is putting out some, there are a couple of bills that are going through our legislative process right now. Um, and, and part of the problem was that uh, there was the ability to grow at home, either caregivers or um, uh, just every resident of the state of Colorado. So my you know, other advice too is if you have the ability to not have personal growth, you're going to be a lot further ahead. We didn't have a choice because it was in the amendments. Um, but the other things that I'm talking about with regard to the lack of federal regulatory assistance, you'll hear me say over and over again, this is still legal to federal level. I'm not talking just criminally. I'm talking about all the other supportive services that the federal government agencies provide to the states. Um, our Department of Agriculture had to figure out pesticides and which pesticides would be um, lawful for use. That's normally done by the EPA. They weren't able to do that, so we had to figure it out. Um, our uh, F our uh, public health department had to come up with lab uh, protocols. It's normally things that we do with, with the FDA. They couldn't do that. And uh, the IRS has been interesting because they actually have a little more of a hands-off approach than, than we had. They actually have come to us to ask us how, uh, help on a number of things. So. Uh, doing this, you'll know that you'll have to do some things that um, you normally have left to your federal partners, but um, I will tell you that, uh, you know, those are things you'll have to take into account until and unless uh, the federal, uh, you know, government moves on this. The last slide tells you how you can get more information, and I want to thank you for letting me come in and talk. But what I want to make sure is that you know that we took this responsibility very, very seriously in Colorado. We knew that we were the first and uh, that we had no model to follow. So what we did is we 
uh, create our own guideposts, and there were three. And so every, every statute, every rule, every recommendation, every process, everything we do, we think of these three things. And one is to keep this out of the hands of kids, keep this out of the hands of criminals, and keep this out of other states. And so everything we do is with those three goals in mind. So uh, with that, um, I want to thank you, and I can be available for questions if you'd like. Thank you. And Kelly's going to handle questions in a second. I just forgot to, at the beginning to say that uh, Can TV, Illinois Family Institute, Columbia Chronicle, ABC, and Blue Room Stream have asked for leave to videotape. They have been. Seeing no objections, yes, you may go ahead and continue. Uh, Kelly? Thank you. Please add Representative Davis to the roll. Um, I want to thank you. Um, this was a lot of information to take in, but our entire um, game plan here as we, as we begin this conversation is to begin from a place of, of learning from other states' experiences. And so you, the, your generosity with your time and expertise and experience is, is very much appreciated. One thing that popped out in your testimony I have a question about, and then we'll, I'll, I'll take other questions. Um, you talked about um, how the, the businesses are audited. 100 percent of the businesses are audited every three years. Do they actually know when, the, when they're up on the, you know, when they're up on the wheel of fortune, or, or is it randomized? Thank you. Um, it is randomized, and just because they have been audited on year one, if we start to see any risk factors that are popping up, they might get audited ta year two and three as well. Got it. Thank you. Are there questions? Uh, okay. Uh, Senator Rose and then Representative Davis. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the copy of the slides that I had here, the tax rates and some of that didn't make it onto this for some reason. So that may be why your, your numbers weren't matching up either. I'm wondering if there's two different versions out there. I don't know. Let me see what numbers I have. Okay. Well, let's just, let's just walk through this. So retail excise tax was 15%. Then you got retail special sales, retail state sales tax, and medical sales tax. What are those rates? It's 15% excise tax, right. so that's on the wholesale. I, I will tell you that using the term retail was kind of confusing because it's really recreational, but the industry didn't like that term, so our legislature pulled out retail, even though it's not retail versus wholesale. So it's 15% excise tax on the first transfer, so the wholesale side, just like excise tax on alcohol. So that's 15% on that. And that's at the cultivation. Then there's a 10% special sales tax on the, at the point of sale. Okay. And then the 2.9 is also at the point of sale. And then 2.9 is your state sales tax rate? Yes. Okay. So then all that, when you, when you add in, is the medical tax at the same rate as the, as the non? 2.9% only at the, st at the state level. Right. Is medical tax different than the retail? Yes, because it's only it only has a one tier, the two point nine. It doesn't have the okay. uh, cult, the excise or so medical is only two point nine. Yes, and then everything else is two point nine plus ten plus fifteen. Well, everybody tries to make that because if you think about it, it's fifteen at that wholesale rate, and right. then it's ten percent at the at the um, retail rate, and so chances are uh, about a pound of of marijuana is. Uh, we have an average market rate of about $1,471, but that's not what a pound of marijuana will be sold for at the point of sale. First off, nobody buys it at that level, but that would not be what that would be. It would okay. be more than that. Let me just make this simple. Does the 10% include the 2.9 or not? No. So you pay the 10% on a retail special rate plus an additional 2.9. Yes. And medical only pays 2.9. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, and the one thing so, I didn't uh, provide to you was the, uh, the amount. And so for the public that doesn't have this in front of them, to date from 1114, we have collected $401.9 million in taxes to date. That includes both of both models as well as the three tiers. Right. So last year, 16, 17, you're at $152.8 million. Uh, no, 1516. It was 142.141.2. No, 1617 was. 1617 to date, because we're not done with 17 yet. Uh, it's 152. Okay, all right, all right. So that's gone up. Yes. 
All right. So, but you had a st statistic earlier that said usage has not gone up. So uh, the price go up? Uh, sometimes. The price goes up and down. But you're saying that that's all a factor of price, not driven by usage. You're a minute ago in your testimony, you said that, that what you found was the people who were using it kept using the people who didn't use it didn't. Yes. And, 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 but so there who's, who's accounting for that increase in, I mean, you went from 88.2 to double that in two years. Well, first of all, there was, we have been, there is still a black market in Colorado, and we are obtaining more and more of those, let, let me see if I can put this in a different way. Um, what we are finding is that we are satisfying about 75% of the demand in Colorado through the regulated market. I will, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and tell you that we were probably su uh, supplying and, and um, and providing, uh, satisfying less of that demand in the regulated market earlier on. Um, if you think about it as, an, as a kind of as a Venn diagram. So these are still people, nice to use the word Venn diagram, which I had not heard since law school, thankfully. <laughs> um, but you're, so what you're saying is that these are people that are coming off the black market yes. into the regulated yes. market. That's what and our so belief is. so that will is. continue to increase for another 25% or so? It, it could be, yes. Okay. Um, so, and first of all, I appreciate your testimony, I appreciate the position you're put in because this is your job as a state employee, right? So you've got to regulate this. But um, I am very concerned, and I want to hear what your thoughts are because I'm looking at a CBS news report from last year that traffic deaths have increased 48%. 20% um, of all traffic deaths from marijuana related um, compared to only 10% uh, six years uh, prior to this. Um, emergency room visits are up 49%. I mean, I can go on and on, but uh, youth rank number one now in, in, in marijuana use um, uh, and 74% higher than national average, but I will admit that, that on that one, I always wonder who kids in, in states where it's still legal would actually admit that, so, um, but I have no doubt that you're number one, uh, but I'm not sure about the, the comparative. But have you looked now at, you know, a couple years out what, the, what this has done and from? Yes, we have. Because you mentioned the societal cost. Yes, thank you. Yes, we have. And actually, as I mentioned earlier, that we have the Healthy Kids Colorado survey that we have done. And in that survey, we have surveyed over 17,000 um, youth. And so, uh, and they're pretty um, open with us. We know how many of them have been, because uh, it's a blind study, so we know how many of them have been using. They uh, One of the things that has gone up is that, uh, the question to is marijuana use risky that's gone uh, there are less kids that believe that however um, the statistics on marijuana use for youth so for teens has pretty much stayed the same and so you were Colorado number one before? was already pretty yeah we were already at the top and I will tell okay. you that the Colorado average of, of youth um, to the national average is pretty darn close. Okay, what, what about the, the emergency room visits and the traffic deaths? Well, the traffic deaths, that's a really interesting one because um, just yesterday um, there was an, another news article that said that uh, DUIs had actually gone down in Colorado in the same time frame as from last year, you're looking at the very first quarter, 33%. So there are a lot of these uh, kinds of stats and, 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 and certainly you know, you're numbers not out there, and it really kind of depends on what it is you're looking at. Okay, so certainly you're not saying CBS is fake news. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm just saying that the news changes. This is a very dynamic right. industry, and it changes all the time. Last question, and, and this is what I think <laughs> worries me about this whole thing this is still illegal under federal law and so now you've had a change in administration I, I mean how how do how do people from a legal rationale look at this and not think that depending on who's sitting in the US Attorney's Office that you couldn't charge one big conspiracy on this whole thing I'm gonna I, I, I'm not because ultimately the states have to follow the federal law Yes, and we looked at that from the very beginning, regardless of which administration was in power. So we were looking at that in 2013. We got a constitutional scholar to be on our task force, and one of the things that we were discussing at that time was the fact of, should this be actually 
um, kind of like in some of the states that have liquor control, where the state controls liquor and they have state um, liquor stores and liquor establishments. Uh, should that be something that should happen here in order to make sure that the state maintained all control? And what we found out then and what we did with a but lot of- liquor's allowed under federal law. Let me tell you, let me, let me just finish. Uh, what we discovered was and what our uh, constitutional uh, evaluation was is that there was a difference between facilitation and regulation. And if you regulate, that's regulating, that's not facilitation. So that's Facilita how you get out of it. But how does the, the vendor get out of that you know here's the thing is that um this is still illegal at the federal level and mm -hmm. so if an if an individual wants to be licensed here i can regulate that but it is still illegal at the federal level risk. and individuals who get into this industry that is uh, a risk that they have to take with their eyes wide open all right thank you representative davis Thank you very much, Madam Chair. How are you doing, ma'am, up here? Thank you. Um, so as I'm looking through the, um, and I apologize, I unfortunately came at the very tail end of your presentation, so if, you're, if I'm being redundant, please forgive me. So just so I understand some of the terms that are in your presentation, I see MJ, MED, MMJ, RMJ. What is, I don't know if you kind of went through all of that on the front end. No, and, and my apologies. I get so used to, to that, and, and uh, I was just listening to someone talk yesterday. It said, quit talking in acronyms. MMJ is medical marijuana. Okay. RMJ is recreational marijuana. MED is the marijuana enforcement division that's oh. within the Department of Revenue. Okay. What's MMJ? I've seen medical that. marijuana. That's medical marijuana. Recreational marijuana is RMJ. RMJ. So MJ is just marijuana. Yes. Okay. And okay, just want to make sure I got all the terms correct. So on your in your presentation, um, you talk about the challenges. I guess it would be page. Well, for us, it's page 23, and you talk about the challenges that exist. So just curiosity, what is, what is, what's the gray market? The gray market is marijuana that is cultivated legally but distributed illegally. And let me give you a couple of examples. Okay. Um, uh, Amendment 64 allowed for any individual over the age of 21 to grow six plants in their home, basement, garage, as long as it was kind of, you know, uh, contained. Um, what happened, what, what can happen is this person will grow six plants and they have a friend that lives with them that grows six plants and there is a term called assist in the Amendment 64 uh, as well that says you can assist someone. And so what has happened and what we are clamping down on is if more than two or three people live in one location and then they grow their six plants, that's way more marijuana than any four people or five people can actually consume in a year. And so rather than so share it with their friends, say, right? they will, what? So you say it's more than they can <laughs> consume. So I say, exactly. Yeah, okay. So there is, there, there may be a motivation to actually sell the excess, and that yeah. would put it into the gray market. It was okay. cultivated legally, but it was distributed illegally. Now, they can give that to their friends, but they can't sell it to their friends. Um, the other thing would be uh, in the caregiver model, which is through Amendment 20, uh, an individual caregiver can grow for him or herself and five other patients and that's usually about six plants well what we found was in Colorado certain doctors were prescribing um, recommending because they can't use the term prescribing they were recommending extended plant counts and there were large numbers of plants that were being grown for patients same thing there is you know there's just so much that can be consumed and so there's a motivation to sell it so um, one of the things that we're doing in Colorado this year is to uh, we have a gray market bill, two of them actually, and so what it's doing is it's putting a bright line test of 12 plants in a location because one of the things that that's causing problems is with local law enforcement. And as I mentioned that half of the, my staff is law enforcement as well, we were very cognizant of that in the state government of Colorado and it was very difficult for local law enforcement to go out and know what was lawful and what was not lawful. And so this year what we're doing is it's gone through the state legislature and we're hoping it'll continue to go through and ultimately get signed into law and that is this gray market bill that will limit it to 12 plants per location and 
even if they have an extended plan count for more because of a patient issue and a, uh, a, a pain issue, they can grow those in some other commercial area. Uh, so it's not in neighborhoods. And that, um, we believe, is going to be giving, allowing law enforcement to have a much more bright line process because otherwise they're left with a lot of ambiguity. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate you explaining that. Um, in, the, I think, the same chart that my colleague referred to where it kind of explains where the dollars go, what percentage um, is given to school funding? Well, it's that entire 15% of um, the excise tax. So well, well the in, in, your, in, your, in your distribution, you have the retail excise, the 15% going into two different buckets. That's why I'm asking yeah, yeah. how much so, of it is for school funding. Well, the first, 40, the first 40 million annually will go into school construction. Okay. So, you know, new heaters, new playgrounds, new um, roofs. And then the balance of that will go into the um, public school fund. So can you maybe in the last year, I guess, can you give me an idea of what that number looked like? Yes. In 15-16, uh, that number was about 42 million, about 43 million. So 40 million went into school construction and about 3 million went into the public school fund. As you can see with the numbers for this year, it's going to be higher and that's going to, there's going to be an right. increase in the amount that's going to the school fund. And, and if you can answer this, and this would be a kind of a legislative question, I'm just curious to know, why did you, why did you take the first 40 off the top for construction and not the first 40 or 45 off the top for school funding? In Colorado, we have something called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which requires us to go out for a vote of the people any time we either increase or we assess a new tax. And in this, with Amendment 64, it was written in that amendment that the first $40 million would go to school construction. So that was part of what was part of the overall structure of that amendment. Okay. Can you explain to me what is the Marijuana Tax Cash Fund and what's that for? Yes, the uh, marijuana tax cash fund is where the special sales tax goes at, at 10% as well as at 2.9. And where that goes is um, the majority of that, the 85% of the 10% goes into the marijuana tax cash fund. 15% of it goes into that participating local jurisdiction um, bucket. And that gets distributed out to local jurisdictions on a pro rata basis based on the sales in their jurisdiction. The uh, medical and the recreational uh, 2.9 sales tax also goes into the marijuana tax cash fund. Uh, so what's the fund for, though? I mean, oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, the very first thing that it is used for is to fund, uh, so, so for same year appropriation, we uh, use that to fund the marijuana enforcement division the tax division, uh, and other uh, law enforcement types of things like drug recognition experts, um, retraining of the dogs, those kinds oh, of things. Okay. Uh, then second year appropriation, because you never know exactly what that amount is and you want to be really careful you don't over appropriate. So second year appropriation is for youth prevention and substance abuse prevention and uh, treatment. Okay. Um and going back to the challenges, um, so I know you, my colleague asked you about kind of the juxtaposition of the state, state and federal government. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't quite say it as eloquently as he did, but he talked about that. But I'm, I'm kind of curious about the banking aspect of it. So does that mean that the people that sell the plants or sell the stuff to consumers, that they're like stockpiling huge, like stuffed mattresses full of cash? I mean, where, where's the... What's the banking side of this look like? Well, in, in 2013, the Department of Justice came out with their um, coal memo to us. They provided the eight enforcement priorities, and that helped uh, regulators who uh, inf do enforcement opportunity uh, challenges and, 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 and activities. In the next year, in 2014, they came out with what was called the FinCEN guidelines, where the financial, and I don't, can't remember what the CEN stands for, uh, and those are the banks, and those are basically to say, know your customer, you know, look at the SARS, because anything over $10,000, you know, you have to, uh, you know, file a SARS report, those kinds of things. And so immediately, we saw a real reduction in the amount of these licensees that had access to banks. Since that time, though, banks have... Um, even though it's not 
legal at the federal level, even though they are under FDIC control. And some of the state chartered um, credit unions are starting to bank with these individuals. And so, and what they have done is, is opened up their books to them. They've uh, allowed them to look at everything to make sure that they're compliant uh, with state rules and state regulations. And as a result, we have some uh, businesses that operate in uh, still in cash, and we have some businesses that have banks or provide electronic funds transfers. Some of them bring in money orders. And so there is, uh, we, we call it that are not so much under, they're underbanked, they're not unbanked, but what they don't have are credit cards. And that's a little more difficult because when, if an individual goes in to purchase, they have to take cash with them. Okay, so you've kind of figured out how to massage the banking side of this some kind of way. Yes, and okay. in Colorado we have managed uh, to obtain cash on an, in a number of areas. Um, gaming is a largely cash business in the industry, so we know how to do the dual controls and, and all that, and we just essentially created a dual control um, uh, kind of uh, money counting, cash counting room, and so we know how to manage that as well. Okay, um, uh, so relative to and I guess this is the way I'll say it To Has there been any major changes to your knowledge? And if you can't answer, I understand um, more of a legal question with regard to statutes. So did, did Cal Colorado always have just criminal uh, dealing with marijuana possession? Did, 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 has they, have they ever done like local municipal tickets to deal with possession? And how has maybe some of that changed um, over, over time to your knowledge? Actually, um, the decriminalization of possession and use of small amounts right. um, was actually accomplished years ago in in many of the larger cities in Colorado, and so uh, now if you you know if you had a larger amount, then that was still you know considered trafficking and a felony, and it still is quite honestly. And there are a lot of statutes and rules. I'm going to show you this book. This is our you know this is Big Red this year. Uh, every year we get this printed from LexisNexis and it has all the Colorado marijuana laws, regulations and all the amendments. And I will tell you there, there is a lot. This is a very heavily regulated industry. In addition there are a lot of the laws that they are still subject to. So if they um, even though a one ounce or less possession is uh, lawful for someone who's over the age of 21 uh, giving it to someone, giving it or selling it to someone who's under the age of 21 is a, is a felony. Um, and uh, also having larger, larger amounts is also considered a felony. So there are, those rules are still in place and those statutes are still in place. It's just the minor possession and minor usage that is allowed for. But um, decriminalization of small amounts of uh, marijuana possession use was, was done a long time ago. Okay, and then my, my last question relative to the um, thought of process about supply and demand um, as you have gone through this process to allow for recreational uses as well, um, has the cost of potato chips gone up? <laughs> you don't I have really to don't that. know. You don't have to answer that. You don't have to answer that. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Senator McConkie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for coming out here today and uh, Always appreciate visiting uh, your beautiful state. Um, I have a, a few questions. First of all, uh, you had the picture in which you d denoted the difference between the medical and recreational marijuana products. Why is it important to denote those differences on edibles and things like that? What, what is the, what what are the different factors that are important to know? Do do they change in? It, does the product at all different between them as far as potency? Or is it simply a uh, so that some, for enforcement purposes, you know kind of where it came from? What, what, what's the whole purpose behind that? So two things. Uh, from an enforcement purpose, we know exactly where everything came from if we have the label because we have that traceability all the way back to the plant. Uh, but the reason for the difference in the two universal symbols, why one of them has an M and the other one does not, is because for recreational purposes, we have um, the department and the state is, has a great deal of authority to regulate the amount of THC that is in a serving. So that is so that's limited to 10 milligrams of THC in every serving. However, on the medical side, a serving um, and the amount of THC is directed by the physician, and so 
one of the things that we wanted to make sure of, and a lot of this is around eliminating confusion as much as possible, was we wanted to make sure that we didn't create an environment by which someone said, okay, I have now a serving and it has this universal symbol, must only have 10 milligrams of THC, because that's not necessarily the case if they pick up something that is a medical product. It could have more than that. So we really wanted to be able to delineate those differences so people wouldn't pick up something from a medical uh, patient uh, and think it had only 10 milligrams of THC. So, so the, the retail uh, portion is, is standard across the board. Medical is not. You have no idea kind of what's in there unless you go to the prescription or, or whatever the referral is in order to identify the quantity of THC in that product. No, the THC is, uh, there is a potency test that is required for medical purposes as well, but it doesn't have to be 10 milligrams. So that will be on the label, what the milligrams are uh, per serving size and per edible. But when you look at, uh, the reason that it's stamped on there is because we wanted to make sure that marijuana products outside of the package were still identifiable as having THC in them. At that point, you don't have the label with you. You want to make sure that at least the product can be differentiated. Okay. Uh, is there then uh, any sort of required education um, for someone, you know, who decides they want to go into a retail establishment and try the product, though you've indicated there doesn't seem to be a lot of change in this, that uh, so if I, if I were to go in and decide to buy a product, is it, how, how do I know what the effects are going to be of this? What 10 milligrams, as a, as a new person who personally have never tried marijuana, is there anything that would educate me on what to expect from this? You know, we, we have certain medications, for example, that indicate that you uh, shouldn't drive while using this product and things like that. Do, what, what types of things do you have? There are a number of things that are required to be on the labels. And there's things like that. Uh, if, you should not use this if you are pregnant. You should not use this if you're nursing. You should not use this if you're driving. You shouldn't use this if you don't know what it's going to do for you. But the other thing is, is that we have uh, some of the educational programs that we have in place from the public health department. There's one that's called Good to Know. And one of the things it talks about is to start low and to go slow. And so there are little slogans that are supposed to be a kind of catchy to help people to understand what that is. Uh, we recommend uh, five milligrams, quite honestly. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna do this and you're gonna consume, start very, very low. The other thing that's out there, and uh, it's information that many of those bud tenders that are in those stores will have information on, and that is um, m edible marijuana is, has a different effect uh, than smuggled marijuana. Smokable marijuana, you can feel the effect pretty much immediately, it's my understanding, within minutes. Uh, however, medical, I mean, uh, edible marijuana, um, it can take two to four hours. It goes through a completely different system in your body. And so that's one of the difficulties, quite honestly, because if you have um, a cookie that's this size and it's six servings, someone will bite off that piece, they'll break it, they'll eat that piece, and if they don't feel anything in that time frame that they think they should, sometimes they'll eat another and another. And so that's a lot of the education that we've been putting out there has been around only eat one, wait two to four hours before you ever look, even think about doing anything more. So there's a lot of education out there and we're continuing to provide much more of that as we move forward. And that's one of the things that that taxation money is used for. So this education requirement is essentially your responsibility, not the sellers. Oh, it's both. It's both. It's both. And you it's you require it, that of them. Uh huh. Okay. Absolutely. We also have what's called um, responsible vendor uh, training as well, and these are um, businesses that go in, at, just very similar to what we do with with liquor establishments, and teach them how to interact with customers. It teaches them how to make sure that the ID they're looking at is you know shows that they're over 21. Those kinds of things. So in regards to safety, uh, you know, obviously every state has a standard in regards to how much alcohol they can have in their bloodstream. I, forgive my ignorance, is there the ability of doing some sort of test of being under the influence of, of driving is the easiest example that, that we normally think of. Uh, is, that, is there a test for that? And if so, what's the standard for that? And is that something that uh, your police departments are capable of administering um. So right now there is, um, it's a, it's a um, rebuttable presumption uh, uh, of five nanograms 
and in the bloodstream. And so, and that is uh, presumed to be impaired, but, um, and I'll explain the difference in a minute. Uh, and it's done through a blood test. Uh, I, it's my understanding, I've been reading about a number of um, jurisdictions that are looking at other things like um, cheek swabs and different things to see about doing that. The difficulty is around the amount of THC that's in your system versus impairment. And the reason I'm going to say that is because alcohol, it goes through and once it flushes through your system, it's done and you're no longer impaired. Um, but THC is stored in the fatty tissues and so it can stay in your system for sometimes up to 30 days. And so you might show that you have an increased amount of THC in your system, but it's no longer active in your system, and so you may not be. So there are a lot of studies that are still, uh, I think, have to be done to really identify what that is. We had to put a stake in the ground, and our stake was five nanograms of THC uh, per, per milliliter of blood. And so as a result, um, that person will get a citation. There are also the drug recognition experts that go out, and they know exactly what to look at. And, they're, and we've, I've met with them, and there are actually different things that they look at for DUID versus DUI. Uh, in addition, so they, are, they have that training. The other thing, though, is that if an individual is cited um, because, uh, because if they don't pass the roadside sobriety or they don't pass, they maybe uh, uh, go ahead and accept and and uh, and say yes to the the uh, blood test. They will um, they can go into court and because it's rebuttable presumption, they can go in and present evidence that rebuts that they are they were under the influence. That's not an easy thing to do, but um, it's something that the judge can take into consideration. Uh, and the reason for that was because we heard a lot of testimony that medical patients just have a higher level of THC generally in their system, but they're not impaired. And so what we're trying to do is figure out what's the right way to approach this. But we still had to take, we had to, it was really important that we take, um, that we put a line in the sand, and that line was five milligrams of THC, and then leave it up to that individual to be able to prove something different if that was the case. So, so is it safe to say that there is essentially no scientifically accepted standard of impairment for use of marijuana as there appears to be for use of alcohol? I would say that I, I would have to say yes, I agree with you, uh, and that's, what's, that's one of the difficulties of this. Okay. Uh, you indicated earlier that, that as a state you saw essentially no change in use. How would you measure that? If a product was illegal before, people were not openly consuming the product, uh, how, how can you effective, or es essentially be able to say we've had no change in use when you're measuring private uh, illegal activity versus whether it be private or public legal activity now? Two things. One, we uh, conducted a demand study at the very beginning because we needed to understand what uh, our production management um, amounts needed to be. So we know what the demand is going to be. And we had that conducted by um, the University of Colorado. They have a special group that does that. And so we were then able to determine exactly how much then of that demand was being satisfied in the regulated market because we, we can track exactly how much is being sold in that regulated market. We've, they have also conducted studies for us that have identified exactly what the usage is for adults. And so that's how we know those numbers. And the youth usage is done through the Colorado Kids <laughs> Healthy Kids Colorado Survey, and um, that's where, um, you know, like as I mentioned earlier, uh, about 17,000 um, youth in Colorado were surveyed, and they're uh, surveyed throughout the state, and they've, they've been surveying these kids uh, since about 1991 on many things, um, and this is just one of those, and so as a result, um, the public health department that conducts that study is very comfortable with those numbers. But a demand study does not indicate use, correct? It, it, it indicates desirability. Mm. I, I would obtain this product if, if, if I could. Not really. The demand study was really about use. It, we, the, the, if you take a look at it, it, it talked about the 
it, it had numbers associated with individuals that had used within the last month, had used within the last 30 days, the last year, uh, how many times a month they used. We have statistics that show that 80, that 20 percent of the users, of the consumers, consume about 80 percent of the marijuana. And so we know even how, what those uh, cohorts are and how much they utilize there. It wasn't so much of a, I would do that if this were legal. It was, this is what I've been doing. And then lastly, I want to go back to your guideposts um, that you posted. I think this is slide 12. Or you indicated there were three main things that the task force uh, were focused on doing. Preventing distribution of marijuana to minors, it, preventing the involvement of criminal enterprises and gangs and cartels, and preventing the diversion of legalized marijuana at other states. Can I ask you first to comment about the minors portion? I know that you spoke a little bit about the uh, penalties. Uh, you have in here a, a, a page on the penalties. Uh, this is on slide 39 in regards to what happens if, if you, uh, you know, violate some of these as a distributor. You did indicate that you know, passing this off to a minor or someone under 21 is still a felony. Do you have ways of being able to measure whether or not, um, you know, people who have going in, buying it, giving it to minors has increased, changed in any way through demand study or anything like that to know whether you guys have been successful in this regard? So one of the things from the regulated side, and as I mentioned, that's the part that I live in, the licensed businesses, is we track from seed to sale. So I can track and make sure that we are not selling, that we're not, that those businesses are not selling to minors, and if they are, they get heavily sanctioned, uh, those types of things. But I will tell you, what keeps me up at night is that 22-year-old person who walks in and buys it legally and goes home and gives it to his or her 15-year-old brother or sister. Um, or their 20-year-old friend or their 19-year-old friend. I worry about that. And that's one of the reasons that we have done a number of things, which is education, as well as the identification of marijuana that you know, in and out of the package. The other thing is that um, there are huge sanctions with regard to that. That's why we're training parents what to look for and, and how, to, how to look for it. Uh, because that is something in a regulated market we can't... Um, prevent uh, any more than we can prevent that 22-year-old that walks into a liquor store and buys, you know, some fruit-flavored vodka and takes it home and shares it with his or her younger sibling. That's something where we really are trying to educate people and make sure that they understand that this, like any other either medicine or intoxicant, needs to be kept up and locked. So, so is there an enforcement? Uh, it's, you, you were saying your responsibility is up until sale. Is there any um, entity that it's kind of their responsibility of doing what they can beyond that point? I know you said you're working on education. Um, is, there, is, there, is it a function of social services or anything like that that is, is looking at trying to get more directly involved in this particular question? You know, we work with our local law enforcement a lot on this subject because it is something that is kind of a shared responsibility between local law enforcement, local jurisdictions, as well as state. Just because my department doesn't look at it beyond sale does not mean that the state doesn't look at that as a very, very huge responsibility. So as a state, I know the public health department is looking at this. I know that others are really looking at what we can do from an education perspective as well as a sanction perspective. Because, th as I mentioned, what we do is we make sure that there are, um, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, poison control guidelines around um, resealability of, uh, of packaging, that it's not. The other thing that we've done also is there are lots of rules and requirements around making sure that they are not... Um, what's what I'm looking for, attractive to children as well, so that you don't have, you know, the lollipops or the gummy bears or any of those anymore. An edible product has to be um, something that is not just sprayed uh, on a product that they've already purchased from somewhere else, can't be pre-manufactured. They have to make it from scratch. So if it's a chocolate, then they have to make that from scratch. It has to have the symbol on it. So we're doing as much as we possibly can, knowing that this is, you know, something that 
everyone needs to help take responsibility for. Um, you know, that's why we're, we're trying to educate parents and giving them the tools. We're giving them uh, things that, uh, educational materials that say how to talk to your kids about marijuana. And so those are the kinds of things that we can do and that we have been doing. So yes, we, we do the best that we can. And at the bottom of that slide, in regards to, I even heard you comment at, in any regard in, in, uh, as far as trying to prevent diversion into other states. Uh, can you just comment on that briefly in regards to what you have do doing since it was one of the primary guideposts when the task force started? Well, one of the things that, that we do is we make sure that in every, that every store that sells marijuana has to have posters that talk about the fact that you cannot take this out of the state. And, um, so you can sell it to non-citizens. Oh yes, okay. we can sell it. We couldn't because of the way the amendment was written. It did not allow us to only um, to to limit it just to, to Colorado residents. residents. So people can come in from out of state and and consume and purchase and consume. So there are several things. One, there, like I said, there are there are big posters in all of the stores, and if there aren't, uh, I want to know about that. Uh, that talk about the fact that they cannot take it out. The bud tenders, when they see their license and the license shows an out of state uh, address, will also talk about that to them. The good to know program also tells them that too, and those are PSAs that are on radio stations and TVs and things like that as well. Um, we've, uh, in addition, at some of the airports, they have boxes that where you can get rid of it before you leave uh, and get on an airplane. And so there are things like that. In addition, uh, the fact that these are, um, uh, like I said, they're, they're heavily labeled. They're very, you know, you can tell whether it's come from either the black market uh, or the gray market going out of state, or if it is uh, something that's actually come from a licensee. One of the things that we do is because of the video surveillance, we can tell who it is that purchased any product at any time because those, those videos are required to be held for 40 days. And so uh, this, I, I will not tell you it's 100%. Um, it is something that we continue to work on, and that's why gray market was one of my challenges, and it remains one of my challenges, and we continue to work on that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Ryder. Um, Director, is it Broll? Broll. Broll. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a, f a few questions. I want to start with the issue of the finances and federal banking regulations. I've actually skimmed the the memo from the Department of Treasury, and it's written like only the federal government mm -hmm. could write something, of course. Uh, so I want, and obviously you're much more familiar with it than am I. I would like you to, to explain to me and the rest of the committee how, how the few banks and credit unions, the instit financial institutions that are working with these marijuana related businesses are doing so and staying in compliance with federal law you're asking me a question about whether another whether another entity what they what their uh, views are and how they what their actions are in order to stay in compliance with federal law um, I can't tell you specifically what they're doing because I really don't know. I, ha I don't regulate the banks, and so I don't have that insight necessarily. But it is my understanding in talking with, um, you know, and some of my licensees as well as some of the banks that have come to talk to us, is that what they are doing is that they were not told that you cannot have. Um, a business relationship with a licensee, but that you must know that they are complying with all state laws and regulations. That is a, that's a pretty high burden. And so one of the ways that my understanding is that, that they're doing that is that the um, licensees are extracting certain reports from the uh, metric system. They're opening up all of their books and records to them. They're looking to see exactly how much is being sold. They're looking to see exactly how much money is coming in and out and so that all of the money that is attributed to all of the sales, because they can get that from the metric system, 
from the licensee, not from us, but from the licensee, so they know exactly how much they've sold and what those amounts were, and they can go back and figure out are they then um, uh, uh, putting that, you know, uh, depositing that much money into their account, or are they depositing less than that, or are they depositing more than that? So it's that sort of thing that it's my understanding is the way that they're doing that, and so. Um, and that's how they're able to deduce that these individuals are actually in compliance with state law. Wouldn't, wouldn't all those things be something a bank would require normally if you wanted a startup loan? You're going to have to show them your plan, here's how, how, here's how much we're going to sell. Here, I mean, isn't that? You uh, know, I, I don't, I okay. would assume that. That's fair. Uh, you, and you mentioned that w one of the things that they've been told is that they've got to make sure that, they're, that they, the banks, are complying with all state laws, which would also be something that you would expect they you didn't say that. The banks have to have to know that they're li that the people who are uh, that their their customers who are the licensees their customers are following the are law. following state laws. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, as a if if you can give me a ballpark, um, what what percentage of your licensees? have a relationship with a financial institution where they can put their money as opposed to keeping it under the seat cushions or whatever else they would do with it to stockpile the cash? You know, I, I'm going to be reluctant to answer that question, and the reason is because it's a public safety question to me. Um, the amount of cash is, is something that I take very seriously. I do have security at that location, and the locations where I, where I accept that, and the businesses themselves come in with security. That's, that's one of the other businesses that's popped up around this, in, this industry has been additional security. Uh, so um, if... You know, no disrespect, but I, I really am uncomfortable talking about that. Okay, I want to be clear, it, and I completely agree with you. It is a huge <laughs> public safety issue. It is a huge public safety issue. Uh, but let's talk about that a little bit later. You, so you're saying that your your division doesn't track the percentage of your licensees that have relationships with financial institutions, or you know that and you don't want to disclose it? Uh, what I'm saying is that I know how much cash comes in, and I and that you could go back and, and extrapolate Got it. that. So if, if so, if I could, you know, if I told you five percent had a relationship with the bank, then you could go back and figure out exactly how much uh, that five percent could be, and know exactly how much cash I was getting, what the ninety-five percent was. That's why I'm, I'm reluctant to talk about that. I completely understand. Thank you. Um, now. I'm going to ask you another question along these lines. Do, do, do you, does your division, are you aware of the, you know, the suspicious activity reports that mm -hmm. under our federal law, do you know, uh, can you tell me whether or not there has been an increase in the filings of those reports since this industry went, went active or, and or, how many are related simply to th this industry? You know, I don't have the answer to that question. Is this a I don't know or is this I can't tell you? This is I don't know. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Okay. Um, you said Colorado limits production, in the, in, but not in the aggregate. It does. Tell me how it does that. So each cultivator has to have a license. And when they apply for a license, they, they, they uh, apply for a certain plant amount. And so, as I mentioned, the demand study, I know exactly how much demand we need to have, how much we need to satisfy in the state. The other re thing that we do is we look to see about whether they're able to sell what they have. So um, they start off with a certain number of plants, a certain plant count, a tier one, for example, and then go up to tier one, two, three, four, et cetera. And so in order to go up to a second tier, to the next tier, they have to demonstrate through facts and data and through the metric system uh, that they are able to sell uh, a large percentage of the marijuana that they cultivate um, in the last three to six, nine, 12 months. So I look across the last year. Uh, and only if they're able to sell like 75 to 80% of that are they allowed to go up one tier. 
um, when they've gone up one tier, or regardless of what tier they're in, if they are unable to sell, because I keep track of that, not just me, all those you know, police officers that work for me, um, if they're unable to sell the majority of their marijuana in each cycle, then I can pull them back down to a lower tier. And that's how we manage it, is that based on not only the overall demand, but also what e in the aggregate, but also, also on the individual basis, whether or not they're able to, to sell the amount that they're cultivating. And the reason that we want to make sure of that is for a couple reasons. Number one, we want to make sure that they're not stockpiling and then flushing the system because that will create a two things. One, a, a drop in price, which means there's a ton of it out there, and we don't want that. We want it to be a very controlled um, introduction of marijuana into, the, in, into the, the marketplace. And so we keep really close track of how much each licensee, each cultivation is allowed to sell, how much they're allowed to cultivate, and how much they're actually selling. You mentioned, a, 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 you said 70 to 80 percent, and then you said majority. It, it's 70 to 80 percent. Okay, it's, 70. Yes. Well, is it 70? I mean, how do you, I mean, that, there's uh, a lot of flexibility there. Tell me okay, how you decide I'd have that. To go, I'd have to look at my rules because I don't have them all memorized. Remember, this is a really big book. But it's a very large amount that they have to be able to know. That okay, they have and the to cycle is three years? Uh, it right. goes back the last year. So it's a 12-month cycle? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, you said that one of the de determinants in deciding how much more or if a cultivator can be a larger producer is based on the demand. Tell me how you're measuring that demand. Well, one of the things is I know overall, from a state perspective, what that demand is to be. So I know overall through the metric system how much is being satisfied within the, the regulated industry and the regulated market. So that's on an aggregate basis. On an individual basis, I know exactly how much each one of them is selling, and I can map that back to what that overall aggregate is to make sure that they're not selling more than that uh, and to make sure that, um, that each one is being able to sell what they're cultivating. Okay, how do you measure, or let's back up then. Tell me how you measure the demand on a statewide basis. How do you know that? We had the University of Colorado uh, conduct a demand study for us. They used a lot of information from the RAND Corporation, from a number of, of places. They did surveys. Uh, the, uh, the demand study itself, I didn't bring a copy with me, will talk about the methodology in which they were able to determine what that demand would be. Can you just give us the name of the website where you can find all yes, those studies? Yes, I know and it's at the very last page of your presentation. And it says, please visit the DOR slash MED website at, and that's that very first one. So, and that's where those reports will be. And every, as, as I mentioned, we, are, we, we wanted to be very transparent. So every report that we have is out there. Okay, now going back to the individual cultivator, um, you said to make sure they're not, I mean, how do you measure, so how do you measure the demand for an individual cultivator? I don't measure the demand for an individual cultivator per se. What I want to make sure of is that they are only producing the, no more than the number of plants that they are legally licensed to produce. Right, but it, don't you make, I thought you made this decision on whether or not they can go to a tier two based on the demand, the demand for the, what they're selling. So the way that we do that is if they're able to sell, and remember, I don't know whether it's 70 or 80, um, that 70 to 80 percent of their, cul their cultivated uh, plants, if they're able to sell those on a consistent basis and they want to move up to a, another tier, then they can move up to that okay. other tier. Okay. So, the, I mean, the demand, the, de the measure of demand statewide is different than what you're using for the individual right. cultivators. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, the, You've referred, I want to make sure I understand, the gray market is people who purchase legally and sell illegally? Cultivate legally, distribute illegally. Right. Okay. As opposed to the black market, which is just um, illegal across the board. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the, what is the price, including the taxes, for marijuana in the legal market in Colorado? You know, that's going to be based on each individual store because they can all do something different. And so 
uh, I don't know what all of the prices are. Okay, can you give me ballpark? I mean, because, and the reason I'm asking I want to be, is because the, the, the higher the price, the more likely you're going to have both a gray and a black market. You would agree with that, correct? I think that is one uh, factor to consider. Okay, but if prices are, if, if prices were, let's, 25 bucks, you're going to, the gray, there's going to be a certain line there. I understanding there are other factors, but if that price is 50 bucks, that's going to drive more participation in the gray and black market. I mean, that's just as a general economic rule. You would agree with that, right? Well, uh, for purposes of this discussion, yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, because okay. what I will say is that there is also a value that uh, people place on being able to buy it in a safe manner, to be able to, to buy it in a location that has some security, that where there are lights and it's not in the back alley. There's a value that people have placed on buying marijuana that, is, that has been tested so they know that it's safe and that they know that if they are found to be in possession of it, that it will be lawful because it's still illegal to buy it in the back alley. And so as a result, there is a value associated with that that's not, so I'm saying that that's one factor. Have you, uh, how many instances have you encountered of, of cultivators producing, and let's say in a given cycle, they produce and sell 75% and then the other 25 percent, they're selling on the black market. How do you prevent that? Because I uh, track every single plant that um, goes through their system. And so when I come in and I do a compliance check, I know whether there are 25 percent of those plants missing. And uh, I can look to see the data, and I evaluate data on a continuous basis. In addition, when they transport from a cultivation to a store, for example, both of them have to input the data into the metric system. And if there is any anomaly, my folks get an alert, and they go out and they do a check and a compliance check. The other thing is that that is considered a public safety violation, and I, can, I will... I have in the past and I will continue to do so in the future, that could cause me to issue an order of summary suspension, which means that they shut them down immediately and they no longer can, can operate at that point pending in order to show cause, which goes before a hearings division that's within my department and they then uh, go through that hearing and determine whether or not um, their license is subject to revocation, whether they can have that uh, fine up to $100,000, those kinds of things. Those are pretty severe sanctions. In addition, there are criminal activities, cr criminal sanctions that take place, and the individuals who work for me have both um, administrative and criminal uh, sanction uh, authority. Um, based on your, your, your experience thus far, most of the licensed into business entities were not able to borrow from a bank or a credit union to start their entity. That's, is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. What, typic, just typically, where did their cash come from? Um, I will tell you, a lot of them tapped out their 401ks. A lot of them um, cashed out any pension plans. They have tapped out their parents, their siblings. These are large family-owned businesses. They've saved for a long time. They worked a second job. I mean, there are a lot of places where they get that money. Uh, one of the things that we do before they're licensed is they have to go through a financial background check. And so my, um, my enforcement division also manages gaming. And so this is another thing that we do in that gaming division as well, which is follow that money. And they go all over and they're pretty much, um, you know, they're financial forensic uh, experts and they look to see where the money is coming from. And so that was one of the best practices that we employed in the Marijuana Enforcement Division was to pull some of those things out of the gaming division. Mm -hmm. And so they do that, that uh, financial background check as well and determine where that money came from, and they follow it. Okay. Um, Senator, if you could please wrap up your question. We have two more people seeking a uh, chance to ask, and we have a witness waiting on Skype. Sure. Uh, you talked about, uh, we've talked about uh, other industries, and well, let, let me back up for a second. You've talked and try to wrap this up into a couple of questions. The 
people, you said roughly you believe, it's your, if, it, it's your position that roughly the same number of people are using marijuana now as we're using before legalization. Is that, is that an accurate statement of your position? The studies that the state of Colorado has conducted uh, indicate that, yes. And you have faith in those studies? I have faith in those okay. studies. All right. What about, now that's people in Colorado. What about the out-of-state traffic into Colorado? And the reason I ask that is because my industrious young staff here during earlier in the hearing uh, found a website, www.coloradocannabistours.com. And what it is is it's a business that says that if you pay 99, I think the price has been marked down from $120 to $99, that we'll take you on a day-long tour of cultivation centers and places where you can smoke your marijuana and, and whatnot, places where you can legally do it. My question is, because you're a licensing authority, is, is in a situation like that, we have a touring company. Are you licensing them? No. Okay. Uh, you're familiar with these companies? Yes. Okay. Is there, other than the cultivation centers, are you licensing any, anyone that's affiliated with these tours? No. Okay. Um, I want to, last, last area of questioning uh, it has to do with unintended consequences. Um, every time, every time, and not just a person, but a, particularly a government, does A, you hope for B, but sometimes you get a little C. Um, and a, a C, a lot of what C is can be controlled through smart planning, good regulation, and sometimes it, it can't be. And the reason that I, I, want, I want to ask you about your experience, and I understand I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I know that you're aware of this. I, I don't know whether it falls within the scope of your duties or not, and if you don't want to answer it, that's fine. But uh, I, I, have, I have a story from summer of last year uh, with regards to the homeless population in Denver. And what it talks about, and, it, and, and, the, and the, center, the, the, the centerpiece of the interview is from the director of the Salvation Army there, who talks about the city of Denver's homeless population re reaching what he refers to as a breaking point and says clearly, it, it, is, it is largely driven by people coming from outside the state here to, ta to, to take advantage of the marijuana laws, and then they're here. Uh, can you talk to me at all about, I mean, the, the, the social ills that accompany this? I mean, I understand, you know, we're all about tax revenue. We're government, so we just want to get more money in. But there is a price to that. And I just, I'm going to leave this open-ended here. Give me your objective, collective experience of, of that issue in Colorado. Well, there has been an increase in the number of homeless in Colorado. Um, where that's coming from is, is open to a lot of interpretation. But given that uh, marijuana is also legal in Colorado, there's obviously going to be a, a correlation there. A uh, couple things. Number one, there are uh, a number of social ills that were uh, that have been around this industry even before it was an industry. And so one of the things that the taxation money is uh, used for in Colorado is not to um, pad the general fund. And frankly, you see how much it is. It's not going to make a, a difference in your general fund. We have a $27 billion annual budget. Um, you know, 150, 160, even 200 million dollars a year is not going to make that much difference. But what it does do is it addresses the issues that you've just talked about. So one of the things that is in the governor's budget this year has been money from that marijuana tax cash fund to address the homeless population and to address some of those issues. And so while I as I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm neither an opponent nor a proponent. I'm not going to come here and say it's the best thing since sliced bread, and I'm not going to say the, 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 you know, the, the sky fell on us. I'm going to tell you that we regulated it the best way that we could do based on the constraints that we had, and I do think we've done a pretty reasonable job. Uh, I also believe that the tax money that comes from that can be used to address many of the issues that you've just, uh, that you've just talked about. Uh, had uh, had there, would there have been as much of a homeless population issue there? Maybe not, but there also would have been no money to address it other than what would be coming from the general fund, and at least now we're able to use what's coming out of the marijuana tax cash fund to address those issues. Okay, thank you. 
Representative Cabello. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just have a couple of questions. Did, uh, has this increased the need of the health care costs for Colorado? You know, um, from the perspective of like insurance rates or is it covered under insurance? No, because it's not covered under insurance and it's not covered for any of those things. With regard to the number of emergency room visits, uh, there has been some slight uptick uh, there. Um, we're looking at that as well because some of that is um, the data. You know, when you start any program, and you, you know, the first year or two, you don't know whether any change is an actual change uh, because there's an increase or a decrease, or if maybe the population now has a better awareness of it, and so now they're talking about it more. Um, so honestly, we really haven't seen much of a difference, and I don't know that we have attributed any difference to that. Um, are you familiar with Pueblo, excuse me, Pueblo, Colorado? County? Oh, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, they said in 2016 they had a substantial increase in women giving birth uh, whose newborn babies test positive for marijuana, threatening the babies with uh, permanent brain damage. Would that you consider that to be a health care increase cost? I think that's a health care issue, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons that um, I think more than just monetary cost, I think that's one of the issues that the public health department has been attempting to get better education out there. In fact, just this week, I saw in the news, just about every day, there was an article there that says, don't pump and dump, because apparently when you're breastfeeding, you can, and you decide to have a drink, you can pump your milk and then get rid of it. And because it's stored in the fatty tissues, you can't do that with marijuana. And so there's a lot of education out there. So you bet that's a problem. And I, I do believe if that, you know, when that occurs, that is a problem. And in my opinion, it's more than a cost of dollars. It's, it's more of an, an education that we have to provide to these individuals so they no longer do that. I guess the, the reason why that is, I, I was asking that question is if, if they're not bringing in enough money to take care of the problems that it is actually causing, um, then we need to want, we want to know that information. Um, and then I also uh, understood that you um, are, and I'm sure lots of other folks in Colorado are, uh, staying awake at night uh, trying to make sure that the children and or teenagers don't uh, get access to this. But it also shows that there's a 70% increase in teenagers that are visiting the ERs that are testing positive. Well, one of the things that we found was that um, prior to about two to three years ago, there was no separate uh, specific uh, code for doctors to identify that there was um, uh, marijuana present or THC present uh, for anyone. And, uh, and so as a result, there have been a lot of training that's been done, a lot of that. So I think some of that might be increased awareness, and some of that might be also that because it's legal, there is no longer the, the fear of going to an emergency room with um, THC These in your teenagers, system. These are teenagers, so they were under 21. Yes, I know. And so, but I, how do I want to put this? I will tell you that Colorado, and I, will, I would be willing to bet you that Illinois does too, that you have a population under the age of 21 that is consuming marijuana. I would agree with you. And, and so as a result, that population is already doing that. Now, that is not to say that's okay. That's saying there already is a problem, so now how do we address the problem? And so well, This was a study that it, since you become legal, there's been a 70% increase well, in as teenagers testing positive. You know, I'll have to take a look at that because I will tell you through the sanction study that the state of Colorado does, the public health department does, it shows that the overall increase, okay, now you confused me. So if they're under age and they're, they're mothers? No, this, this, this said that uh, since 2015, uh, there's been a 70% increase in teenagers visiting the ER okay. that are testing positive. Okay, so, and it, was that in Pueblo? Because no, what I will tell that you is that the healthy, Colorado. the healthy kids survey, really, and I just finished talking to the public health department before I got here, and what they told me was that ER visits have gone up to some extent, and there has been increase, but they don't know if it's more issues or if it's just more awareness. And that, um, or if it's more kids at that age are more open about having used. And so that's what they're trying to do right now is, is figure that out. They do 
feel that it is a significant increase, but the total number is not that large. And let me give you the numbers. Um, out of 100,000 visits of teens, uh, it was 789 that were previously um, uh, went to the emergency room with THC in their system. It's now gone up to 913. Both of those are less than 1%. And so, the, the, and that's what I'm, I'm going to um, uh, encourage you always to look at both the numbers as well as the percentage of increase. Because if it was one and it went to two, it would be a 100% increase. But if it was one or two out of 100,000, I'm not saying that's a valid number and we should ever allow for that. I'm just saying it, it, you have to look at that to be able to, to identify whether that's indicative of a large problem or not. I received that uh, information from one of your state representatives. Okay. Um, the other questions that, that I have is, um, does every single dispensary, are they taking cash or is it, again, just certain ones? My understanding is that they are unable to, um, I would say that uh, the majority of them do take cash because I don't think they're able to take credit cards. I'm sorry. I said I would bet that most of them take cash because I don't believe they're able to accept credit cards yet. Okay. So there's not one specific area or uh, place that just mm -mm. accepts the cash? No. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I just want to, you, you said that the they've only just recently started tracking THC as a separate code. Yeah, so about so three that years could ago. also account for... Mm -hmm. That increase, it wasn't tracked separately, and now it is. So, of course, there would right. be an increase. So that might be, that, that might be right. a component of it as well. Absolutely. And, and there's actually a report that was produced by the Department of Public Safety. And in there, and it's on their website, and if, if that's something that you would like, I can send you a link to that. But in there, that was one of the things they talked about, is that the, the stigma has been reduced. There's uh, more awareness of it, and processes have changed it to allow for coding and things like that, that we have to look at numbers and the data a little bit with a grain of salt. Great, thank you very much. And finally, Senator Staines, and then we'll get to our next witness. Yes, and I, I'm gonna be really brief. I really wanna thank you. This has been incredibly informative um, in terms of uh, getting an overall view of what's happening in Colorado, and really appreciate your taking the time to, to join us here today. Um, one really small question. When you went from um, just medical to adding retail or recreational, was there a supply issue then for medical that there wasn't enough that to meet the need for the medical marijuana that we should be thinking about if we were ever to do that here? So one of the things that we did um, was that we only allowed for the first nine months medical businesses that were in good standing to apply for the recreational licenses. They also had to um, identify uh, what the products were, the, the number of plants that they were gonna be moving and converting from their medical side to their recreational side. Uh, and they could only do one transfer of that. And so uh, as a result, there was a lot of uh, concern among the medical patient community that there would be some sort of a shortage on that. What we found is that didn't really happen. Uh, and, and mainly because they were allowed one transfer they had to identify it up front, they moved it over, and then that was it, and then they had to figure out how to either purchase more or grow or do whatever they needed to do. Um, the medical, com the medical uh, marijuana stores maintained the amount of marijuana that they needed to. We didn't really see a shortage. Okay, and um, did, can the same facility, and do they often sell both the medical and the retail? Yes. Um, they have to have them separate, and they have to have a separate point of sale system. And the RFID tags are different colors, and one says medical, and one says uh, retail. And the reason for that is because of the difference in potency, as well as the um, who gets to purchase. So you have to have a medical marijuana card to purchase on the medical side. You must be over 21 to purchase on the recreational side. And um, the other reason was because we wanted to make sure that whatever was supposed to be taxed on the recreational side got appropriately taxed. So even though they can sell and they can cultivate uh, in the same location, they have to be virtually separated. 
And you talked then about the fact that you really goals are trying to keep it out of the hands of teens, out of the hands of, you know, uh, out of the black market illegally and out of state. Um, do you feel that um, under this regulatory framework that you have now, do you have a way of assessing whether or not you think you're doing a better job in Colorado overall? There's less of that available in the black market to teens and others than before. How do you think big picture, I guess I'm asking, it, it has, has this uh, new format and structure gotten to those issues? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, there's less and less um, marijuana that's satisfying the demand in Colorado. Um, wait, I didn't say that right. Less and less black market marijuana that's satisfying the demand in Colorado. There's more and more regulated marijuana that's, being do that's doing that. They require uh, that you have a state-issued ID. They require that you're over 21. And so if you think about it, the more we can move to that regulated market, the less opportunity kids are going to have to be buying it off the street or from their local dealer because there will be less and less of them. Okay, I am sure we are going to want to be in touch with you as we think about this going forward and really do appreciate your willingness to be so open and sharing it. You guys really have been, uh, you have the, I think, probably the hardest job in terms of being the first and trying to figure this all out and it's really gracious of you to share your wisdom of what you've been learning. So thank you very much. You're, you're welcome. And I just want to leave you with one last thought and that is there are things that we have to continue to work on and we always do that and we do that as a, as a full cabinet. Uh, there is a marijuana working group in the cabinet, so all of the departments that uh, work together and have some uh, impact in that and some affiliation with that work together so that we can address the issues. In addition, the fact that we use these stakeholder groups also allows us to really be nimble and flexible and move very quickly when we have a problem because you will have problems and you need to be able to be able to fix them and, and work on them very quickly and so that's one of the things that we've been able to do and so thank you so much for uh, letting me come and talk with you and I appreciate that. Um, and now um, we've, we've gotten the view from the first state and I want to thank you director for, for being so generous with your time. We're now going to be joined um, in what I am told is the very first virtual witness um, in the Volandic building by Carmen Hansen, who is a program director with the National Conference of State Legislatures. Thank you for uh, making the accommodation for me to present this material today. Uh, I just wanted to let you all know, um, I've worked on health policy for NCSL for roughly 16 years and on cannabis and marijuana policies for over 10. And um, NCSL is the nation's most respected bipartisan organization providing support for states. And we uh, serve all state legislators, 7,383 uh, legislators and over 30,000 legislative staff. And I'm going to be providing this uh, information as requested um, by your joint committee on marijuana and cannabis policies. And I'm gonna do a little bit of overview of medical uh, policies and the adult use categories and some information on the current legislative landscape. And I'll also be using the terms marijuana and cannabis interchangeably. And as a reminder, NCSL takes no positions on individual state policies and provides this information as an overview of the state actions and legislative roles. And I've done my best to remove any intentional and unintentional puns from my presentation. And while some uh, folks may find this topic of marijuana and cannabis amusing, I can guarantee you that this issue is taken very seriously by, as you just heard, uh, the state of Colorado, um, NCSL, and policymakers across the country. And I'd also like to thank Steve and Ted and the rest of your committee for working with me on this pres uh, presentation that I was able to do remotely today. Uh, going on to my second slide, the state legalization of marijuana started with California back in 1996, and since then, mostly Western states uh, also legalized medical use by ballot initiatives, which is more common in the Western states than the Eastern states. And states began legalizing medical use via the legislative measures a few years later, and currently all but five states have some sort of legalized marijuana program. And please note on my slide, you'll see that West Virginia has a little asterisk on it because they approved a medical cannabis bill through the legislature just uh, last week and they're, uh, potentially it's going to be dark green uh, pending the governor's signature, but that's, I just wanted to designate that on that slide for you. And the rest of my slides will provide information on these various programs. 
And I know that your primary focus for uh, your hearing is medical, but you, it, or is recreational or adult use, as I generally refer to it. Um, I'm just going to give a quick recap of kind of uh, the, pr the process and the progress uh, that um, medical programs have taken. And as I mentioned, California was first back in 1996 through um, voter initiative. And since then, 28 states, D.C., Guam, and Puerto Rico have followed, most of those since the year 2000, making for a total of 31 programs. 16 programs were voted in by voter ballot initiative, and 13 were approved by legislative bodies. And I'd like to note that not all of the appro approved programs have been implemented to date. It can take anywhere from six months to 24 months or even longer to get a program up and running, depending on the process in each state. And that time is also similar for adult use programs. And I've provided a link to NCSL's medical marijuana webpage here for your reference. And most of that information covered in this presentation can also be found on that uh, page. So as you may expect, looking at slide four, no two medical marijuana cannabis laws are, uh, are similar, but they're, they're, they're not alike or identical, but some similarities do exist. Uh, most programs include provisions for following issues like patient registries, grower and caregiver registries, dispensaries, uh, require specific conditions for the use of medical cannabis, and or they may recognize patients from other states or they may not. Um, most states with medical programs do have registries and possession limits range anywhere from one ounce to eight ounces of product or three to 12 mature plants or seedlings. And the other categories can also vary. Uh, for example, the license, the amount of licensed dispensaries in a state. Some states limit that with a hard number and some, so for example, Connecticut has a hard number of six dispensaries for the whole state or um, Minnesota started their medical program with four. Um, and they also may limit when it comes to growers and dispensaries within local zoning and licensing procedures, uh, if they want to allow them in their municipalities or counties or not. And as Director Burrell uh, mentioned about Colorado, many cities and counties uh, allow for commercial growing and dispensaries within their jurisdiction. However, about a, it's about a third that, that do not. Uh, I believe that if that's the right ratio, she can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but licensing and registry processes also vary widely across the states, and most states have a qualifying list of conditions for the medical use of cannabis. Uh, some states are kind of silent or yet to be determined on their details on implementation, just because they can take time and these details aren't necessarily included in the uh, ballot initiative le uh, language or in the legislative measure. And it also can take, like again, anywhere from a couple weeks to uh, a couple months or up to a year to get all these rules and regulations in place. And let's see here. And I just want to point out that the state health departments generally operate the medical programs. However, a few are run by attorneys general and offices of consumer protection, public safety, or justice. And one of the latest issues with medical marijuana is uh, new or low THC limited research programs that have come about in 2014 and 2015. And it's a growing interest that states, I think you can't hear me, so I'm gonna try calling Steve really quick, sorry. We can hear you, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, you can't? Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, we're just, we're moving the microphone to try to make it a little bit better for the folks who are listening to the live stream, but, but we can hear you. Okay, sorry, Do you want, am I loud enough? You're fine. You're fine. It's okay. our technology. Okay. It's not you. It's not you. It's us. We promise. I'm sorry. Keep going. You're, you're doing fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's a bit of a delay with the, with the, uh, you know, so, um, so the new, the, the, one of the new things with medical marijuana programs are the low, the new low THC or limited research programs that have come about in mostly 2014 and 2015. It's a growing interest for states looking to find a way to provide access to non-psychoactive um, cannabidiol products or CBD products um, without creating like a full-blown comprehensive medical marijuana program. Um, 17 states passed these bills a few years ago. Um, Idaho had a program approved by the legislature but was vetoed by the governor. And again, more information on these programs can be found on my webpage. And the next slide has some more of those details. Um, again, most of these programs are not functioning as intended because they did not allow for the in-state uh, 
manufacturing or growing of the cannabis to develop the product. So um, it kind of created a barrier to access. It might have said it might be legal for you to, to have these products um, with a medical um, excuse or medical defense if you were arrested in possession of these products, but um, they didn't they didn't create a system of regulation to create and then and sell the products within their state. So um, I know I know it's not necessarily the focus of today, but I'm happy to discuss these programs with you later if you have additional questions. And looking at slide seven, uh, like anything else, the medical use of marijuana has its advocates and critics. Uh, shortly after California legalized medical use of marijuana back in 1996, the Institutes of Medicine came out with its own opinion, and it found that marijuana helped some patients with pain relief and any side effect was generally short-lived and well-tolerated. In late 2012, the Treatment Research Institute released its own opinion based, uh, opinion based on its addiction-related research, and they do not advise using marijuana for medical use. And since then, there's been a lot of different research uh, you know, coming out from full support to no support at all, and most kind of come in somewhere in the middle saying we see maybe some promise, but we definitely need to do additional research. Um, various uh, health groups and associations have their own opinions. Uh, groups like uh, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, American Cancer Society, American Glaucoma Foundation, and the National Multiple Sclerosis Society and others um, do say that there could be some promising uh, uses of, 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 quote, medical marijuana or cannabidiol-based medications. Um, however, more research is, is for sure needed. Um, as was mentioned previously, marijuana does remain a Schedule One product federally, seen as having no acceptable medical use. However, as uh, Director Brohl mentioned, in 2009, the Obama administration stated that they would not actively prosecute those uh, folks operating businesses in the states that followed uh, their medical distribution guidelines and business practices uh, as long as, you know, as they were highly, being highly regulated in those states. Uh, she mentioned the Colm Amendment or the Colm Memo that was in August of 2013, and that was the Department of Justice memo announcing an update to their marijuana enforcement policy. And it uh, mentions that as, while marijuana remains illegal federally, the DOJ expected legalizing states to have strong state-based enforcement efforts, and they will defer their right to challenge their legalization laws at this time. Keywords at this time <laughs> that everyone seems to refer to. Um, the department also reserves the right to challenge the states at any time they feel it is necessary. Again, this was specific to the adult use laws in Colorado and Washington at the time, but it is similar um, position taken for medical states as well. And this all could change as um, Attorney General Sessions has been heard in the media um, with their current position of the new administration. And so that largely sums up the medical side of things. Um, looking at slide eight, and I'll start uh, looking at the adult use issue. And in 2012, two states, Colorado and Washington, legalized small amounts of marijuana for adult use, often called recreational use. Uh, Colorado's Amendment 64 and Washington's Initiative 502 both passed by popular vote. And as, again, as Director Brohl mentioned, I'll try not to repeat too much of what she said, but it really was uh, unprecedented for, for, for Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper to appoint a 24-member task force to have the responsibility of coming up with the actual rules and regulations for uh, the cannabis industry in Colorado. It included four legislators, members of the Public Health Department, Department of Revenue, and the Governor's Chief Legal Counsel, among others. They announced their comprehensive recommendations in a quite large report back in March of 2013, and sales started on January 1st, 2014. Uh, Washington State uses their Liquor Control Board and Liquor uh, and Cannabis Control Board to implement their law, and their retail uh, sales started shortly after Colorado in the summer of 2014. Uh, NCSL has published quite a bit on these two states and their experiences. We have, I have uh, li links on the um, slide in on my website. We have two magazine articles called Legally Green and the Green and Winding Road, which detail the process of establishing these rules and initial implementation status, and those can be found on ncsl.org. Uh, library. And we also have two other legis briefs that take a closer look at Colorado and Washington's experiences and the legislators' thoughts about the process. And those publications are listed on a later slide for your reference. And uh, 
after Colorado and Washington, there was Alaska and Oregon and the District of Columbia, and they all passed voter initiatives to allow for legal adult use of cannabis products. DC's effort is different in that they only uh, allow for growing and possession, and it does not otherwise regulate the production or sale of cannabis. Alaska is currently issuing permits and is just now rolling out their dispensaries. And the Alaska law allows for individuals to grow and possess limited amounts of cannabis, and that was as of two years ago. Um, so that was kind of a quick, as soon as the law was um, enacted, there was a short kind of waiting period, but then it became um, okay for possession in, in self-grow um, a few months after the election. And they now have the Alcohol Beverage Control Board or a new entity, if they decide to create one, that would regulate um, production up there. And most recently, in, back in November, four states approved new adult use programs in California, Maine, Massachusetts, and Nevada, and the details are still being worked out on those new programs. Uh, slide 9 has a 2017 summary of bills to allow for the, either the medical use or adult regulated market or both. Some of the bills in red have already died for uh, this session. As I mentioned before, there were some ballot initiatives uh, last year that, that were successful, and Arizona was the ballot initiative that was defeated for adult use. And some states have proposals out to, to amend current programs and laws. As, again, Director Broll mentioned, there are constant changes, and um, what are looked at as through the legislative process is improvements to what's going on. If they do see a problem, say with edibles or testing or something like that, they try to address it as quickly as possible through the legislative process. And those uh, adjustments or um, legislative measures are not listed on this slide in particular. And there was also significant legislation last year relating to marijuana, generally like uh, one of the legislators mentioned the decriminalization aspect and penalties, the criminal justice side of of cannabis use and possession. And our criminal justice program follows that issue and may be contacted with any questions because I am not a, a criminal justice policy issue even though it does have a lot of overlap with the cannabis topic. So slide 10 has uh, shows some of the adult use legalization efforts that have come through the ballot initiative process. And while not all states have the ballot initiative process, it's important to know that the legislature still has played a very important part in determining rules and regulations for the medical and adult use related programs in those states. And um, again, uh, Director Broll mentioned all of the activities that Colorado has um, been going through. Legislators are drafting legislation and regulations and using uh, some of the directions from that enabling language of the ballot initiatives or the piece of legislation in response uh, to what you know the voters may have, have approved at the ballot box. Uh, some legislatures have direct oversight of implementation and evaluation of programs and procedures. Some of the most common areas of regulation established by legislators are the establishment of fees, tax structures, and enforcement of regulation funding. Oversight is typically assigned to another state department like public health, revenue, or another agency. And as I mentioned, many of the states allow localities to further regulate or prohibit locations and operations of cannabis-based businesses within county or city limits. Uh, looking at slide 11, uh, this is about over uh, regulation and oversight, which again varies by state. As you've heard, Colorado has a marijuana enforcement division within the Department of Revenue. Washington uses their state liquor and cannabis control board to implement their laws. And NCSL has, as I had published, quite a bit on these two states. And let's see here, that goes back to how um, things are pretty similarly regulated as far as the categories and how um, they can possess or grow in certain states. Um, Alaska allows for individuals to grow and possess limited amounts of cannabis. Um, adult use is all, for consistency, it's above 21 for all adult use states, um, but the regulations can vary on how much someone may possess, cultivate, if at all, um, cultivate and purchase. And those, I made two little um, kind of cheat sheets on the next two slides. And the first slide are the original four states, Alaska, Oregon, Colorado, and Washington. 
And it's a table with information from various sources that track the specific details of each state's regulations. I have to give uh, many thanks to the different organizations and state groups I've contacted to find some of this information because this 50 state data or you know tracking anything across 50 states can be quite difficult. Um, so it, it does take a village to track the details on many of these. And see, these are some of the categories that I mentioned varied by state, but you will see some similarities. Uh, the most variance can that is out there can be seen in the tracking and security issues. And I can say um, from Colorado's experience that testing and tracking issues have gotten much more specific in the last two years since the industry uh, went to adult use production. And now um, it, that has expanded into the medical side as well. Um, Director Broll was mentioning the edibles and how they're labeled uh, with the little special symbol and the 10 uh, milligram kind of doses per per uh, serving. Um, those That is an idea that is now being used both on the adult use side and the medical side. And uh, there are also more discussions about local limits on licenses and types of licenses and procedures that uh, NCSL doesn't necessarily track local um, actions on cannabis laws, but um, I can find that um, if, if necessary. And from what I understand uh, from my experience speaking with other legislators in other adult use states, Washington has gone through similar learning curves and making improvements like thanks to testing and packaging as they are able to as they see that um, it's one of those unintended areas that just wasn't covered in the initial legislation. Looking at the second chart of, of detail, this includes the, the four newly approved states and this information given here is just what is currently known or understood to be the um, to be known for out there for data and of course it may be slightly adjusted by any additional rules or regulations created by further legislation and the differences with these new four states compared to the original four states is that some allow for a larger personal possession and include a different purchase limit for things like concentrate products extracts and that's something that some of the original states didn't necessarily include at the start. Slide 14 has some basic observations on tax revenues for each program. And I really have to tip my hat to Joe Henchman with the Tax Foundation. He's kind of one of the uh, cannabis tax gurus out there in the policy world. And I really appreciate his uh, notes on this. Um, tax collections in Colorado and Washington both exceeded their initial estimates. And it's estimated that nationwide implementation of adult use and taxation could raise you know, upwards of a billion dollars per year. Um, another thing to note is that Colorado, Washington, and Oregon all reduced their initial tax rates um, or considered reducing their initial tax rates a bit because they believe that the higher tax rate would not necessarily reduce the black market demand as much as they would have liked. So they have adjusted their tax rates down in most cases cases to help bring the to shrink that price differential between the retail market and what has seen on the black market um, and it does tax issues with this is one of the most difficult uh, areas of policy and it takes time to develop these tax systems and establish consistent reporting and tracking as again director Broll mentioned and uh, do not underestimate the role of health agricultural zoning, law, local law enforcement, and criminal, criminal penalty issues with this um, topic. They are largely unaddressed in ballot initiatives and are left to the implementation process. And um, as again, Director Broll mentioned, there is another type of overview. Uh, in Colorado, only a third of counties allow for medical or retail production or sales in unincorporated areas. And as she mentioned, it's about the same for medical and adult use. Uh, for those restrictions. And uh, I think Director Broll did an excellent job of covering the excise tax and the special taxes. So there's the 15% excise, excise tax, which goes to the, the, the $40 million school improvement grant fund, and then the 10% special sales tax that the retail purchaser pays, and that amount funds other efforts, which I'll go into more um, detail in the next slide, and then the 2.9% sales tax rate. And as mentioned, medical products are not subject to the additional tax rates except for that 2.9% regular sales tax and any local sales tax on top of that. And uh, Director Broll has had the current number of year-to-date sales and our $1.3 billion in sales 
uh, last year resulted in roughly $200 million in tax revenue. Slide 15 shows some information from a Colorado Legislative Council report from last July. And this was a report on one of the first years of how, it was a breakdown of how that, how that revenue was spent. So uh, the, as she described, the, when Colorado voters approved retail marijuana, the measure dedicated the first $40 million of excise revenue to school construction, and that's in the state's constitution. And to facilitate that, the General Assembly referred a 15% excise tax to the voters because of our Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, our Tabor Amendment, um, and that made the first 40 million go to that, for, to that best funding um, schools, building excellent schools today, it's an acronym, B-E-S-T. And that is used or to renew or replace deteriorating public schools on a competitive basis, and that money is awarded annually. In 2014, the legislature created the Marijuana Tax Cash Fund, and this is where the other sales and special sales tax goes. It has to be spent, as the director explained, every year as it's collected and used largely for health care, education, substance abuse prevention, treatment, regulation, oversight, and law enforcement issues. And uh, in 2015, Colorado made headlines reporting nearly a billion dollars of cannabis sales, and that translated to more than $150 million in taxes and fees. More than $35 million was earmarked for schools, and Colorado is now fully funding that $40 million promised to the schools grant program. Um, as far as sales go, generally there is twice as much sold on the retail side as the medical side. And there's just a couple numbers there on some of our latest, the, the latest sales numbers, 2014's total was 699 million, 25, 2015's total was 996 million, and in 2016 the total was 1.3 billion. And um, again, that the 200 million combined in, in tax revenue and fees, uh, considering the overall budget of Colorado is 28.5 billion is a very small percentage. Uh, here is the latest from Washington and what they're doing with their tax revenues. Washington has a 37% excise tax on all product sales collected at the point of sale. Uh, the first 12 months of their sales was roughly 257 million and taxes on that was roughly 64 million. And according to the legislative fiscal note, this is the breakdown on how their money was broken down and it's listed on the slide. Washington's basic health care fund and general fund will receive the largest portions of the revenue with other prevention and education efforts receiving the remainder and of course program administration is covered by, um, by the excise tax. And Oregon has less of a track record to analyze but here's an overview of their tax methods. They have a temporary tax on adult use sales by existing medical dispensaries and it's 25% at the point of sale and that's to the customer, that's the customer's um, responsibility. And once their new retail dispensaries are up and, and fully functional, the tax will be 17% and localities are allowed to add another 2% to that for their, for their own um, tax purposes. There will be an estimated 350 licensed adult use retailers in their, in their first fiscal year and that number may grow up to 550 in the next few years. The revenue collected in Oregon will cover administrative costs, school funds, behavioral health services and treatment, law enforcement, and the state health department. Localities will receive funding based on population. However, areas that prohibit retail sales won't receive any marijuana tax revenues. And slide 18 will give a quick overview of Alaska, which is the last program to become operational. In fact, it still isn't very operational, but this is what we do know about what their initial tax and revenue structure looks like. Um, sales were expected to start late uh, last year, and their Marijuana Control Board, which was set up shortly after legalization was passed, adopted regulations effective February 21st of 2016 relating to marijuana packaging, store locations, distribution, edibles, and social clubs. And that would be like um, an adult bar for liquor, a social club would be an adult bar for uh, marijuana consumption. And the license application period began early last year and their marijuana inventory tracking system started shortly after that. 
Their ballot measure two set up a $50 per ounce tax on marijuana paid by the marijuana cultivator when marijuana is transferred to a retail store or product mar um, marketing facility. At the current going prices of $250 per ounce in Anchorage, this would be an, an effective 20% uh, tax rate. Uh, however, legislators in Alaska have explored alternative taxation options. The State Department of Revenue estimated tax revenue between $5.1 million and $19.2 million per year, with regulatory and enforcement costs between $3.7 million and $7 million. And time will tell what their actual numbers look like, but again, we'll be sure to follow what happens. Washington, D.C.'s legalization law is very different from the other state efforts. The D.C. law allows for adult use and possession, but does not create a regulated retail market for sales. D.C. is also complicated by the role of congressional oversight. Um, there is a particular member of Congress who is not supportive of marijuana legalization, and he inserted an amendment into a federal budget bill which prohibits the district from using any federal or local funds to, and this is a quote, enact or carry out any law, rule, or regulation to, dis to legalize or otherwise reduce penalties associated with the possession, use, or distribution of any Schedule I substance. End quote. This makes it nearly impossible for D.C. to create a regulatory or tax structure for commercial sales. One estimate has claimed that the district could generate about $20 million a year if they had a regulated sales system. Slide 20. We're getting close to the end, I promise. <laughs> Slide 20 is a quick overview of the, of the currently proposed tax rates and oversight agencies in the newest states. California will have both a cultivation tax of $9.25 per ounce for flower product and $2.75 per ounce for leaf product. And uh, consumers will pay a 15% sales tax. Buyers in Maine will pay a 10% sales tax. And Massachusetts purchasers uh, look, are looking at paying 3.75% sales tax and up to an additional 2% local sales tax if their localities choose to implement the local tax. Nevada has a 15% excise tax on wholesale prices, or wholesale sales, excuse me. And oversight is also varied and is housed in various agencies, which I have also listed um, at the bottom of the slide. So those are the main points of, of kind of what I typically get asked about, what are states doing when it comes to legalizing a cannabis? And here's just a couple other questions I tend to get um, I get a lot of really interesting questions on this topic, as you may not be surprised, um, about uh, state marijuana policies. And so a lot of questions I get are about what are the tracking rates of diversion and, and, and uh, minor access and things that you've already kind of asked uh, Director Broll. And I really appreciate her ability to, to address a lot of those with much more detail than I'm aware of. Um, but the, the number of the amount of diversion from, this was medical programs the last time it was really kind of analyzed in any kind of detail. Um, one particular study in Colorado, and uh, it might have been one of the studies that Director Burl mentioned, that one of the early Colorado studies when before the adult use was, was kind of a thing or right after it became legal, said that the teens reported in the study rep said 70% of them were accessing whatever uh, products they were getting, whether it be traditional flower product or an edible, they were getting it from um, a medically qualified person. So it might be someone they knew that had a license or a parent or a friend, or maybe they stole it from someone who had um, what we call in Colorado a red card, a medical uh, cannabis access card. That statistic may have changed with adult use retail sales. It hasn't, I haven't seen any reports from within Colorado yet. Um, I do know our Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has some extensive studies going on right now. Um, there is currently $9 million of some of the marijuana tax revenue that does go into funding state um, kind of social impact studies, some of those unintended consequences, um, as some people describe them, because um, there's unintended consequences with any and every kind of policy. So this policy is, it, the area is really no different than a lot of others via transportation or um, education, things like that. Um, so Colorado does have a lot of studies currently underway within Department of Health and uh, within the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. There are some federally funded uh, research products processes also going on looking at Colorado data, and I believe Washington State has um, some similar studies going on. 
And let's see here, another question, uh, it, it goes back to the medical side, you know, which, which organizations suppo uh, support or oppose medical use really varies widely. Um, a couple organizations track this much more closely than we do. Um, groups like the Marijuana Policy Project, Pro um, Project SAM, Normal, a lot of those groups have pretty extensive lists of, of publicly uh, released opinions on support or not of medical use. And let's see here, but uh, many of the, of the health groups, as I mentioned earlier, really are hoping for more federal research in this area for um, rigorous scientific double blind, you know, typical uh, clinical trial style studies for, for medical use. And my other number one question I get is, who's gonna be the next state to do something? Um, well, none of the adult use programs that are out there currently in the eight states have been passed through a legislative body. They've been all through the ballot box by voters. Um, and my other thing that, that is an out for me, NCSL doesn't prognosticate because there's no way to give an over or under on anything like this. Um, so that's, that's something, that's an easy answer for me. Uh, but nearly all states with existing programs will have bills to make adjustments. As, as I mentioned, Colorado, you know, there are no less than, I think the last, one of the last legislative sessions, maybe not the one currently, but last year, I think there were um, well over 50 bills to, you know, make changes and improvements to, um, to the programs. And you know, again, this is just like any other area area of complicated policy. There is constant change, constant knowledge gain, um, new research all the time. It's it's a pretty exciting area of policy to try to keep up with. So uh, the last next last slide is a current listing of most the most current NCSL resources on marijuana policies, and they're all available online. And I'm ha uh, happy to answer any questions about those or anything else. And uh, last slide is my contact information. I'm so happy that I was able to um, accommodate the request today for testimony. And um, please contact me at any time if you have any additional questions. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. And I think this was pretty fun to be the first uh, guinea pig for remote testimony in Illinois. <laughs> Just a quick question. In terms of, it seems like there's many different ways people sort of set up their regulatory overstretch, uh, over, um, you know, regulatory structure. One of the things I'm wondering about is it, it looks like Colorado, I mean, California and Nevada were going to a three tier system uh, where they had sort of the distributors as well as the cultivators and the retail. Can, yeah, I don't know. It, I've, if you're hearing me, uh, the question is, what's the advantage of going that approach versus not? Do you have a view on that? Madam Chair, it's a little hard to hear. Um, I don't know if maybe Steve can repeat the question for me or if I can try to pull up the live feed and, uh, and it just might have a bit of a delay with the, with the question and answer. I, I think that it, it, we are having a little bit of, of connection trouble. The question was about distribution systems in various states, whether okay. s some are using a three-tier system, not unlike the way we do alcohol from production, distributor, retail, um, you know, sort of the differences in those distribution systems from state to state. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, that is uh, one of those implementation questions that I haven't looked at personally very closely. Um, I do have some very good connections with uh, other uh, legal entities and business consulting experts that I can probably ask to get more detail on that level of distribution uh, mechanisms within the states, but I, I don't have that um, level of information. There's also what they call vertical in vertical integration, and Colorado did have that, meaning that a dispensary, which is where you would go purchase your product, um, a single dispensary had to grow up to 70% of their own product that they sell in their stores. Um, and they're getting rid of that requirement in Colorado, so they're um, getting rid of vertical integration, so to speak. Um, but that, that's about the extent of what I know about the distribution and how many kind of interplays there are um, before it gets to um, the retail market. But I can check on that and let you know. 
Great, thank you very much. And thank you for your patience with our technical issues and for being our test case on this. Um, and with that, I wanna, wanna thank you. I think um, we probably, uh, yeah, given the technical stuff, I think we'll, we'll, we'll thank you for your help and thank you for your contact information and your promise to, to follow up with any of our other questions. I do appreciate it. Absolutely, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, with that, I just want to um, thank the members of the committee for your patience, for, for, for sticking it out. Um, as, as we said at the beginning, we anticipate that this is going to be a lengthy conversation. We want this to be a very vigorous and thoughtful conversation, and we want to hear from everyone who has, an, ha, has something to say, um, to share as we, as, we, as we build this out. Um, today, you know, we got a lot of information to digest as we, as we move towards our next hearing, um, and I look forward to the, the continuation of this conversation, and anything you have to say? No, I think with that we can adjourn. Yes, so the Public Safety House Public Safety Appropriations Committee stands adjourned. Yes, does the appropriation want to the Senate?